I know it's not quite a 601. We can begin, thank you. Okay. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us to our, for our March 9th uh, Board of Commissioners virtual um, work session. Uh, I'm going to uh, call the roll as I've done in previous, and I'll acknowledge before I call roll that Commissioner Fuller is not present at this time and he will be joining us later in the meeting. Um, Commissioner Fort, you're muted. Here. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Campbell. Here. Commissioner Sitton. Here. And Commissioner Michael. Here. Okay, we are here. Uh, first thing on the agenda for me is to read a proclamation for the town of Davidson Arbor Day. Whereas the town of Davidson recognizes the value of trees as a precious nat natural resource that improves the appearance of our community, increases the value of commercial and residential property, reduces energy cost, moderates air temperature, decreases soil erosion and stormwater runoff, provides habitat for wildlife, absorbs air pollutants and produces oxygen. And whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. And whereas this day known as Arbor Day is now celebrated throughout the nation and world. And whereas the state of North Carolina has determined that Arbor Day shall be celebrated annually on the first Friday following the 15th of March, and whereas the town of Davidson has been a tree city for the past 10 years and earned a growth award for 2019 efforts. And whereas the town of Davidson has adopted a tree ordinance, hired a full-time arborist and appointed a livability board to protect, conserve, maintain and enhance trees in our community. Now, therefore, I Rusty Knox, mayor of the town of Davidson, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim March 19th 2021 as the town of Davidson Arbor Day 2021 and call upon all citizens of our town to participate in the celebration ceremonies and activities on this day. We urge all citizens to support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands and we urge all citizens to plant trees to promote the well-being of our present and future. Proclaim this ninth day of March 2021. We move on. Um, first item on the agenda will be a presentation uh, on the Davidson Main Street grants. And I'm gonna call on uh, Kim Fleming as soon as uh, Betsy brings her up. Welcome, Kim. Hi, thank you. We've got a few friends joining us. Betsy, do we have Makar as well? Yeah, yep. come in right now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> a little delay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, normally we would be presenting big checks to these big as in like, you know, the jumbo checks. Um, but couldn't figure out how to do that via over Zoom. So we're gonna say nice things about them instead. Um, hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, I am going to um, talk a little bit about each one of you. Um, and so when you're up, maybe just wave um, to the audience. And, um, and then after we're done, if you would like to say a few words, you can, but certainly not necessary. Um, but first of all, thank you, Mayor and Board of Commissioners for allocating $15,000 for this year's Davidson Main Street grants um, and for all the help and support that you've given our businesses over the last year. It really has been amazing. And um, I know you all have shopped and eaten and um, voted to extend money to these folks. And it really is very much appreciated. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone what the goals of this grant in particular 
are to provide direct financial benefit to small businesses, to retain and create jobs, and to spur private investment in our local historic district. I also wanna thank the members of our Historic Preservation Commission. Um, they reviewed all of the applications and they are awarding four grants to the businesses here with us tonight. Um, so the first one is the Village Store and Megan Blackwell is with us tonight. Um, and, and tonight, one of our oldest businesses on Main Street, the Village Store is receiving a $2,000 grant. Um, I don't know why Megan went away. <laughs> She's she's muted and turned her picture. I just have to talk her camera back on. <laughs> Die. Um, but the village store really is the quintessential Davidson merchant. It's run by Megan Blackwell and before her, Irene and Taylor Blackwell. The village store is so much more than just a business on Main Street. Irene and Megan are responsible for okay. most of our beloved events in Davidson, including Christmas in Davidson and Concerts on the Green. Megan is the one that other businesses go to for advice, and she is the one always willing to help plan an event or post about one of her fellow businesses on social media. The Village Store is an one simply cannot come to Davidson without a trip here. And now this sweet old building has new floors and fresh walls and a ceiling and lighting for many more generations to come and enjoy. So thank you, Megan. <laughs> thank um, you, guys. <laughs> Allah Masti, Makar, you're up next. Um, it is remarkable that not only have our Main Street businesses continue to operate during this pandemic, but that two new businesses have opened this last year. Both of these new businesses will each receive a $5,000 grant. This is a testament to our businesses and the community that supports them. Masala Masti opened on Main Street this year to the delight of many. Makar had been looking to open an Indian restaurant in Davidson for years, right, Makar? That is true. That is very really true. Since 14, Finally, 14. <laughs> when a space opened up, he jumped on the chance to bring Indian street food to Davidson, and we are so thankful he did. Upfitting the deal house for a restaurant was not without its challenges. Trying to fit large modern equipment into tiny historic hallways was not an easy task, but Makar persevered and now Main Street has a beautiful restaurant and courtyard with even better food. So thank you, Makar. Hey, Ms. Kim, but I do have to say, uh, Kim Fleming, she did an amazing job. I went to her um, for a lot of my questions and uh, someone to answer them for me. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and not to be outdone, Matt Santos opened his store, Davidson Provision Company, affectionately known as Dave Proco, right after Masala Masti. Matt did such an amazing job of building excitement for the opening of Dave Proco I think Megan and I were like pressed up against your window begging to be your first customers. Um, Matt transformed the existing space on Main Street into a beautiful store with large storefront windows, an indoor stage and outdoor space leading out to Knox Court. Dave Proco is a great addition to Main Street and Matt is a collaborative and helpful business owner to the many businesses around him. Thank you, Matt. So can I say one quick thank you? Because like my story involves, I'm looking at all the squares here and involves like half of the squares. You know, it all, you know, I, I couldn't be more thankful, you know, not only, you know, obviously for the grant, but just the people that make up this town and the leadership, you know? So, uh, you know, my story just super quickly starts with David Stewart, who is right there, who I've not seen in a while. 
And if for, for those of you that might not know, I actually live here in David Stewart's old house. And that is how kind of the relationship started. Um, you know, so it started with a conversation with David who, you know, gave not only myself, but also my wife opportunities to start businesses in the area. Um, Kim, and then it went to you to kind of um, tell me how to do it. Uh, I've never started a new business before. And, you know, you made the process, you know, as easy as could be. You made it, you made it fun. Um, Rusty, I sat with you um, in the very early stages just to kind of talk through ideas. I also sat with John Woods um, and it's been wonderful. You know, everything that this town has done has been fantastic. I mean, all the way down to Vishal who feeds me uh, with my, my favorite Indian food. And, you know, one of the biggest thank yous also goes to Megan, you know, um, as somebody who's never done this before, it's scary. Um, and it's a scary time to try to, you know, be new at this and to have your neighbor be able to come over and share all kinds of information that a lot of people wouldn't into how to look at business and how to predict, you know, different financials. Um, you know, I, I just can't say enough things uh, good about this town and the people that, um, you know, are, are part of it and the people that are on this phone call. So if I missed anybody, I apologize, but it's, I, I just saw a bunch of people here on the Zoom that were part of this. I just wanna make sure I said thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, David, we miss you. Hi. Okay, and this is what I wrote, Matt. I know that Matt would say that Davidson Provision Company would not be possible if it wasn't for the work of David Stewart. Absolutely. Um, one, 120 South Main LLC is receiving a $3,000 grant for their work in transforming 120 South Main into the space that houses Dave Proco and what will be the future home of TSG Residential, Movement Pilates, and other office tenants. David and his team opened up a building that nobody knew what was inside into a beautiful dual storefront building with office space on the second floor. Uh, we thank you all for your investment in Davidson's Main Street, and we wish you many years of happiness and success. Um, and your checks will be in the mail, your actual checks. Um, so we, we had great um, applications this year, and we know it was a tough year for everyone, and we're just, we're so thankful for all of you, and we really just it makes you're you're what makes davidson davidson so thank you all thank you thank you kim thanks mayor thanks board thanks and matt i would i would tell you that i'm sure david will attest that he's got your logo on the slopes in montana <laughs> i sure hope so i, I do have, oh boy. i do have i do have pictures of your logo on the slopes in sun valley for my kid too there so you go they, well, we, they, we, my boy my boys wear their t-shirts proudly. There you go. Well, David, none of this could be possible if you, did, if you didn't do all of your tremendous work. So thank you. Hey, likewise, Matt, you guys have done a great job and thank you, Mayor and Board. I uh, appreciate the support and the enthusiasm. But we really, we really appreciate you, appreciate all you guys and, and for the fortitude to, to keep your head up during the, this last year, particularly, it, we're a town of small businesses. And, 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 and you are the fiber of, of what makes this town special. So uh, thanks to, to all of you for the infusion that you give to, to keep us what we are. So thank you. I wanna say a quick thank you also to everyone. And David, I have to say to you in a year where there hasn't been a whole lot of fun, it has been tremendously fun to watch the, um, those buildings kind of unfold first with the Davidson Pro Co and now with the additional one. So that has been fun to watch in a year of not a lot of fun. So thank you for that work there. Yeah, absolutely. And Megan, when do I get to hang the balloons? <laughs> oh, God. oh my God, this is like the first Zoom call I've ever done. Um, so you know the balloons that are over 50 years old are up. Okay. So you need to, yeah. 
You need to come see him. I'll yeah. come christen them then. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That Hope Nichols sister did. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Kim. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> well, it seemed a lot like our first Zoom call too. In all fairness, if if you go back to our first board meeting on Zoom, it's it's not not that inconsistent with that that meeting. And none of them turned themselves into cats. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I expect that chat. We we I have one transportation board that we use WebEx instead of Zoom, and and if there's like seventy people on this meeting, and and everybody has to be muted except for the speaker, or you hear everything. You hear paper shuffling. So I I, I would say that this is a better platform for me than than WebEx is. But and no, I have no interest in Zoom financially. But I, I like where we're at right now. Okay. Thank you, Kim. I know she's signed off now, but thank you. Um, next up on the agenda is the Charlotte Regional Transportation Planning Organization, CRTPO, 2050 Metropolitan Transportation Plan. And I'm gonna start this off with Jamie. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the Metropolitan Transportation Plan or the MTP uh, defines the policies, programs and projects to be implemented through 2050 in order to reduce congestion, improve safety, support land use plans and provide mobility choices in the CRTPO planning area, the Charlotte Regional Transportation Planning Area, and that's Mecklenburg, Iredell and Union Counties. It also addresses the goals and objectives of the CARPO, the various components of the transportation planning process, socioeconomic and financial assumptions and transportation related environmental and health issues. So the significant component of this 2050 MTP, which I know seems like a long way out, but that's how long it takes to get projects done, is the project list, which identifies priority projects uh, for all modes of travel through the year 2050. So these projects, they have been submitted by the different communities. They'll be evaluated this spring, and then the public will have an opportunity to weigh in on these prioritized lists. And so what we want to do is show a very brief video for community awareness so everybody knows what this is all about and what's coming because there's opportunities to engage. So Betsy, if you could start the video. The Charlotte region has experienced incredible growth over the past decade, and that trend is projected to continue for years to come. It's vital that we have an efficient transportation system that enhances quality of life and supports our thriving economy. Development of the CRTPO 2050 Metropolitan Transportation Plan, or MTP, is underway. One of the primary purposes of the MTP is to adopt a list of projects that address the transportation priorities identified for the region. Development of this project list includes community input, evaluating the projects through a defined set of criteria, and receiving feedback from transportation professionals and elected officials throughout Iredell, Mecklenburg, and Union Counties. We're also working hard to engage as many people as possible in the transportation planning process, from all walks of life and all backgrounds. It's vital you review and comment on these projects to ensure your priorities are included. Get involved and have your voice heard. I live in Davidson, but I go to school down here in Charlotte, and no matter which way I try to get home, there's always traffic. So I'm just wondering if any of these transportation projects are going to help me out. I live in Union County, but my office is in Uptown Charlotte. I commute there every day, which takes at least two hours. Will this plan do anything to improve my commute times? I love coming to the coffee shop every Saturday with my friends, but sometimes traffic and parking can just be such a pain. I just want to be able to get on my bike and go. We now have a draft Metropolitan Transportation Plan that establishes goals, objectives, and transportation priorities through the year 2050. The plan also complements other planning efforts going on in the region. Together, these plans and projects will help us build a better transportation system for our region to benefit our residents and businesses, make the movement of freight more efficient, and expand our greenways and pedestrian network. Before the 2050 MTP is adopted, you have the opportunity to give us your opinion on the recommendations and priorities that have been developed. 
Your input will help us prioritize the projects that you want funded and constructed. Planning for transportation does not end with the adoption of the MTP. CRTPO is committed to ongoing outreach to ensure that residents remain engaged with transportation decision making and enhancing how we all move around the region. Please stay engaged by using the online resources of CRTPO. You can also contact the CRTPO staff person or reach out to your local officials. The Charlotte region has an exciting future ahead of it. Thank you for your involvement throughout the development of the 2050 MTP. We look forward to making your vision for the Charlotte region's transportation future a reality for generations to come. All right, thank you, Betsy. Appreciate you showing that. And uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Jane Campbell is our representative at CRTPO. So, uh, Jane, if you have anything to add, it's very, very important that folks engage on transportation. Thank you, Jamie. And, and I was just going to add that when those public comment periods come open, um, one of the things that I'm always impressed at is um, Davidson residents um, disproportionately participate. And that's awesome. Um, at times we have basically out participated like four or five other municipalities within the, the region. So um, we'll look forward to that again, making our voices heard. Um, kudos, we, we got in those video um, snippets um, there at the, uh, the outset of the video. But again, um, as Jamie alluded to, these, this is long range stuff. Um, there are things that are in this plan that uh, there will be some of us who will not see these um, programs, um, but it's, it's critically important to have a long range vision when you look at everything um, that we're talking about. And as noted, this is multimodal. This is um, planes, trains, automobiles, bicycles, and walking. So um, really appreciate and glad that they were able to, to send us this video. We had the option too of, of having it brief presented, but I thought that this was probably the best thing for this venue um, so that people could see it, so. All right, thank you. And Mayor, that's all we have on this item. Mayor, you're muted. Um, thanks, Jamie, for the for the video, and thanks, Jane, for being our, our go to with CRTPO. That uh, it can be a thankless job because it's, it's it's a lot of a lot of meeting hours and a large agenda to look at. So thank you for doing deep dives for, for us on that one. So, all right, we come to item four on the agenda. That's changes to the agenda, Mr. Justice. Mayor, if I could, I'd like to provide a status report on the town attorney search. Uh, if you want to do that here before we go to the COVID-19, I'm happy to do it. That's the only change sure. I have. Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so just to give an update on the town attorney search, the town has selected an individual to be the town attorney. Uh, her name is Mary Ann Swan, and we are excited to formally announce her uh, very soon. So while she is a licensed attorney in three other states, she is working through the process now to uh, get her law license here in the state of North Carolina. And COVID has certainly been slowing down the process a little bit here with that. So, uh, so as we wait, we felt it prudent to go ahead and bring her on board to start working with Steve Gamble, our interim town attorney, and so she can hit the ground running when her license is approved. So it's been very valuable for, for, uh, for her to come on and start meeting with staff and with Steve. And so that's what she's been doing, getting acclimated and researching items. And so just want to thank Steve for his service here as our interim and helping to acclimate Mary Ann's been very, very helpful with that. And so it, it seems like we're really set up for a smooth transition. And so what we're hoping is the license uh, comes through really any day now and that we're able to uh, plan for a formal appointment where the town board appoints her as the town attorney at an upcoming town board meeting. So that's really where, what we're waiting on to be able to do that. So uh, just wanted to provide an update to the uh, public about where we are on town attorney. So uh, Mayor, anything you want to add to that? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, 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 uh, I, I can't thank Steve enough. Uh, I think his prior experience helped him uh, jump in with both feet and, and and really do an outstanding job for us. And I can't thank you enough for 
for for being that crutch that we needed, Steve. Uh, and I and I think his experience in doing what he's done um, locally uh, will will go very far in in helping acclimate Marianne to where we are in process and everything now. So uh, again, I, I'm looking forward to uh, to uh, getting her up to speed with the North Carolina bar and. I, I guess you can go to golf course, Steve, then. I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe putt-putt course. Thank you, Mayor, very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. No other changes, Jamie? No, sir. Okay. So we're going to move on to item five, which is the town of Davidson COVID-19 response. And I'm going to turn this over to Jamie Justice, our town manager. All right. Thank you, Mayor. What I prepared was just a couple of uh, quick highlights of updates of where we where we stand and also in particular talk about vaccine uh, distribution as we go forward. Just thinking thinking that through. So uh, as far as numbers, I thought it might be good just to update. As of yesterday, March 8th, the state has our zip code cases, total cases cumulative uh, for as 1446 and 15 deaths. So the death count's been the same the last two weeks. So that again, that's our zip code. That is not Davidson city limits, just to make sure that distinction is made. That's, that's what they show. And then for the college, they are reporting today two active cases out of the 2,131 tested students, faculty, and staff. So that number has very much improved over the last several weeks. So that's where we stand on numbers. And, um, one thing I did want to make mention to you, Karen has been uh, tracking this a little bit, our assistant manager, is the federal stimulus bill, and it's coming through the process. You all have seen that in the news, I'm sure. And the, where, where it's tracking at this point is uh, I think the House is going to eventually vote on the Senate version tomorrow, and then, then it would be going to the president to sign to become law. And we've been watching that stimulus package just to see what's going to be in it, and uh, it does make reference to some direct aid to, to the states, as they've done before with the last CARES Act, but also to local governments, and that could be counties and, and towns. So what we don't know, we don't know exactly what this final version is going to be, so we're kind of waiting to see, and at that point, just understanding what, what's in it and what the what, where those funds could go, what's eligible, you know, what that means. So that those are some things we're looking for and we'll be able to provide the board an update once we get some more information on that. So is Karen, anything to add uh, left out on that? That's just a quick overview. No, I think that covers it. Um, still more to come. Okay. So we'll keep an eye on that. And then on the vaccine front, uh, what we're planning for, as most folks know, we did that clinic, uh, public health requested at the Ada Jenkins Center. And so that's those first doses were done. And so now we're gearing up for the second dose of that for those same folks at the Ada Jenkins Center on March 16th. So that was about 240 some doses. And so those folks will be coming back there. We will stand that up again, very similar to what we did before and bringing in some uh, some volunteers to help make that happen. And we did learn a lot through that logistical process. So uh, thanks to Kim and all the staff and you all for helping to make that happen. So we'll, we'll help make that run even smoother on the second one. And uh, so that's on our horizon to implement uh, coming up. And then as far as a as ma mass vaccine clinics and kind of where do we go from, from here, uh, clearly the availability of vaccine is improving, particularly with the Johnson & Johnson coming in. And as the governor mentioned today, you know, I think a lot of that Johnson & Johnson has been pushed out and then it's gonna be a couple weeks lag before another large slug of Johnson & Johnson comes in in addition to the Pfizer and the Moderna. So uh, good news is the vaccine supply is starting to really ramp up. And so that, that's, that's the good thing. Uh, Town of Davidson at y'all's direction, we have said to public health, we're, we're ready, willing and able to do a mass vaccine clinic in Davidson just tell us when, you know, and so they, they very much know we're, we got our hat in the ring and are ready to go. And so we are awaiting public health guidance or really any medical system that wants to partner with us. We're ready to go. So that call to action is out there. And so we're just waiting on guidance from, from those folks if we want to be able to do that. And so thank you all for your support and willingness to make that happen. So that's where we stand there, stand on that. 
I do, I do see from the policy call discussions, just from vaccine strategy and where we're going, I do, it does seem as if more avenues of vaccine availability is going to start opening up. So pharmacies, the uh, grocery stores, met, smaller medical facilities are going to start getting more vaccine. So kind of as we discussed before, the existing infrastructure that's out there, utilizing that is more efficient than standing up these bigger mass vaccination clinics that that we need to do in the county. And so uh, that, that is a good thing because I think at, at the end of the day, we're ready to do a mass clinic in Davidson, but if we end up not doing one, I think a lot of that has to do with the availability has grown to such a point that it's really being pushed out in these multiple other areas and it makes it more available and efficient for, for the citizenry. So I think that could be a good thing, not necessarily a bad thing, but regardless, we're ready if called upon. So. Uh, so that's the latest on vaccine distribution strategy. And I think the final message is, you know, the governor did, you know, uh, uh, kind of change the stay at home order, but the public health guidance that's been so effective so far with washing your hands and wearing a mask and staying separate is still valid and is still the recommended course of action. And we just, we just urge folks to continue to be very careful and, as we go forward so that we can move out of this pandemic and uh, and move forward. So that's my that's the status report. Karen, anything to add before opening up for any questions? Okay. I don't have anything. Any questions or comments? Jamie, just to, to, to add to your thing, this afternoon after our um, groundbreaking event, um, Commissioner Michael and I bumped into, at a social distance wearing masks, um, a neighbor who was able to get um, their vaccine today. And um, so this is, you know, I think we're down to the level where it was at the pharmacy at Harris Teeter. So um, I don't think it was the pharmacy at the Harris Teeter in Davidson, but the one in antiquity. So to the point that we were really pushing for, which is venues that are within five to 10 minutes that are safe for transportation um, for individuals that may not have their own, you're exactly right. And, and, but that's exactly why I was pleased though for the so many of the folks who were able to come out to Ada Jenkins, but it, it does seem to be going in the right direction in terms of that more local availability versus getting in a car or using some sort of transportation to get to someplace, you know, 30, 45 minutes away. And mark your calendars for the 16th. Uh, for the second round at Ada Jenkins because we'll still need volunteers that day. So. That's right. Be on the lookout for an email from Kim and uh, take all help that you all are willing to help us with. And Autumn, you, you've got to drive one golf cart the whole time you work. You can't kill the golf cart and get a new one. So I'm a master golf cart driver, so I'm happy to share those skills at Ada. Okay. Good deal. All right. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Karen. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, item 6A is Livability Board recommendation for fiscal year 2022 nonprofit grant process. Uh, and uh, Betsy is bringing on Gina Carmen from Parks and Rec and George Berger from the Livability Board. Hey, Gina. Hey, George. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Uh, good evening to everyone, the mayor and the board of commissioners. Thank you for allowing us um, to share this time with you. Um, I'm going to start it off for you guys. So the board of, of commissioners has asked the livability board to review the nonprofit grant process, specifically um, the requirement that uh, says that nonprofits requesting funding um, that those funds can't cover operational expenses. Um, and so the livability board has discussed that and George is, I will pass it to George and he will uh, sort of present the recommendation. Okay, good evening, Mayor and Council, our commission. Um, first off, let me say thank you to uh, the mayor, to the commissioners and senior staff for all the support that you all have given the livability board over the years and for letting us work with such great staff members, both in parks and recreation, but also in the other departments that we work with on a regular basis. But to the point about this, um, as you all remember from um, past discussions, the 
guidance that we received initially, the livability board received initially related to the not-for-profit grant program was not to fund operational uh, expenses uh, solely, I think, uh, for the reason that it dilutes the breadth of the grant, the possible grantees by um, stacking operational expenditures into uh, the relatively small amount of grant funds that we're able to uh, deliver to the public over the course of a year. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, and this is really, it really is a two-sided coin. On the other hand, very small, very new organizations do need uh, a leg up a starting point. And we've seen this um, in a couple of occasions over the course of the grant program where um, there are um, organizations that are worthy of grant funds, but they really don't have the ability to deliver the services they would like to without having either staff or uh, other operational costs covered within their mix. And so some of those have uh, petitioned us for redress of that and they've uh, talked to you all as the commission about redress of that. And so, uh, as Gina mentioned, <clears throat> the, um, the board has asked us to take another look at that, which we did on the January 19th meeting. Uh, we discussed both sides of the coin, and I think there was a, a general understanding and generally supportive, uh, support from everybody on the idea that, that some amount of operational costs should be um, uh, provided under certain circumstances and under fairly um, rigorous uh, time commitments so that a, an organization just getting started could be able to use operational costs as a part of their grant, but at the same time, it would not go on forever. Ideally, we think that the, the program should allow an organization to evolve and stand on its own feet, so to speak, and they might use it for the first, and the original um, proposal was for the first three years and then get out of the operational business and the, the uh, staff people or, or uh, whatever the program needed to be would then um, uh, be able to fund its own operational costs and then the town would be able to move on to other organizations and support them. Um, there was robust dialogue at the January 19th meeting and um, there was um, a good amount of conversation on both sides relating to the fact that we only had a limited amount of funding available each year. And, and there really was a, a, um, a sense of urgency that we spread the, the funding as, as broadly as we can because we have such good organizations that want to get started and want to fund things that we know are successful in, in and around Davidson. So as I mentioned, the original uh, proposal was to allow for funding for three years, up to three years. And it kind of worked its way down through the course of the discussion at the meeting to one year. And there was a, uh, we took a vote on that. There were eight members of the livability board in support of that. One member was opposed to that one year um, element and then two members abstained from the vote entirely, um, uh, not wanting to make a decision on this thing. So that's all I've got for you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and I, I know that Gina can as well. Hey George, thank you for all the work um, that you and the, the livability board do. And we appreciate the most everybody weighing in. Can, can you give me a little bit of background on the one no and on the two we're not going to weigh in on the whys? <laughs> I can't really. Yeah, the, the, the two abstentions are more than anything else, just um, not being sure of which way they felt, I think. And the one no um, was clearly um, in support of the idea that, that particularly for new organizations, one year of funding for um, operational support may not be enough and that three years might be better, two years would be better than one. You get the idea that you know, a, a, a grant award in perpetuity for using operational funds, or I mean, for using grant funds for operations may not be the best, uh, the best way to, to go about it, but one year wouldn't be enough. So I think some, probably somewhere between one and three years is good. All right. 
Yeah, and I think I think you know I appreciate the feedback, and and I think making sure that the the non for profits have enough time to kind of get propped up and get up and running, I think is prudent. I think anything beyond that, the board as one of five should codify that with a formal contractual agreement where you clearly define the services and 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 right. that will happen outside of what we're asking you all to to review and, and support or, or make recommendations on. So thank you for the, I appreciate the thought. Right. And I would say that, I would say that that is, a, that, um, that is one of those elements of the grant program that is universally supported. That if you have the availability of additional funds for organizations that um, the town believes strongly should be supported, that the, that the program might not be the best fit. So it would, there, you know, the, the program is great for starting out. And then as you pointed out, maybe it's time for a, an organization to move into a contractual op, or relationship and take it over from there. And just to mention that the other, the two that, some more background information, the two that actually abstained were two new livability board members. So their comfortability level wasn't to the level where they felt comfortable voting um, because they weren't as familiar with the process outside of what was what went what was discussed in the, the livability board meeting. Hey, George and Gina, again, I add my thanks as well. And and Matthew actually stole one of my questions, so let me pivot off of that. And based on the other eight votes that were supportive, you seem to allude to towards the tail end of the conversation about the one. Um, saying it just wasn't long enough. Were any of the eight a one and absolutely only one, or were any of those eight votes for a one year acknowledging the fact that if somebody came back with a good, you know, solid reason that like a one year with a renewable, or did you guys break it into, mm -hmm. yep, we're just talking, we think it should be one year? I, you know, I really don't remember that that particular detail of the conversation, but I did, I do remember um, clearly the fact that there were some folks on the livability board, and I think I think there's justification that's for sure, that that still believe that the potential for using grant funds for operational expenses just has the potential to uh, even at one year. Um, dilute the breadth of the, op of the opportunities that, that small organizations have. So I don't know, Gina, do you remember anything specific about that? Um, I don't, I think there was a consensus that three years may give um, an opportunity for people to kind of just kind of lag along and not really right. you know, <laughs> get it together, quote unquote. Um, and there was some flexibility that maybe there would be a chance for renewal if there was a good enough reason um, to request those funds again after the year. Yeah, so maybe, maybe um, I think given my question, at least for me, prior to a formal kind of vote on this, Gina, would you mind resending the link to the livability board meeting so I could just watch that uh, discussion and, and just, I think that'll help contextualize it a little bit for me. I mean, George, we're asking questions and we've got the tape. So we'll, I, I'm happy to just re, uh, watch it and, and listen and interpret from there. I can take care of that for you. I'm also doing it by calling it tape. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Gina or George at this time? I want to thank both of you for the, the work on this. This, is, this has been an ongoing uh, discussion that we've had, not a dilemma as much as a discussion. And I think um, it, it, providing these grants is essential for nonprofits, but I think moving further to define uh, specific guidelines, I think is something that's... Uh, you know, it's going to evolve over time. So I think uh, this this definition will, will help in moving forward. So thank you. You're welcome. And I, I would just add one more thing. And that is that we look at it, we look at the guidelines as something that's a living set of guidelines that 
probably should always be tweaked a little bit around the edges when tweaks are necessary. So we expect you all will, will give us guidance and we'll provide it back to you and you know, every other year, whatever it is we need to do that on. Sounds good. And Mayor, this was really just for discussion tonight and Gina can prepare kind of the updated documents to bring back to the board for y'all to approve. So if that, is that what the board is interested in doing, having staff work on updating the documents and bring it back to you? Yeah, if you're looking for direction, I would say that's probably the right direction. Is everybody in agreement? we get a thumbs up. Yes, sir, please. And thank you. Okay, so we'll write that down as an action item. We'll share the video with everybody and then start working on bringing the updated document back to the board. Sounds good. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Gina. Thanks, George. Thank you. Okay. Next item is to consider approval of Charlotte Water Waterline Extension Project to Davidson Point. I'm gonna turn this over to Town Manager Jamie Justice. Okay, thank you, Mayor. We're gonna bring a couple guests in from Charlotte Water and I'll introduce those folks in a minute. And then my thought was I would provide a brief overview as much as brief as I can, and then uh, turn it over for the board to discuss potential action item tonight. So. All right. So welcome our friends from Charlotte Water. So who we have with us tonight is we have uh, the director of Charlotte Water, Angela Charles. We're so glad to have you with us. We know you were with us a couple weeks ago and had to depart. So welcome back. And uh, so thank you for being here. Appreciate your support. And we have Deputy Director David Zerr back again. So David, thank you for being here. And then we have Dr. Gina Kimball, uh, lab supervisor with Charlotte Water. So they are here to help answer any questions we also do have, just so everybody's aware, uh, any, if we have any fire protection questions, we have Interim Fire Chief Ryan Monteith available, and we also have a representative from the developer, Michael Johnson, uh, in the wings. And so if there's questions and we want to talk to them, we can br bring them in if needed. So that's the plan for, for this presentation. So we'll go ahead and get started. All right, uh, so as, as we discussed at the last meeting uh, in regards to Charlotte Water, they per, they're our utility service provider for water and sewer for properties within the city limits of Davidson uh, based on our 1984 agreement with the city of Charlotte for that. And that lays that out. And Charlotte Water is undertaking now work to replace and improve the existing water mains through a big part of Davidson city limits. And so they're uh, seeking the opportunity and really to fulfill serving the Davidson Point neighborhood, which is in the city limits with water service and uh, to provide services to all our properties in the city limits. And that would be through the extension of a water line into Iredell County up to Davidson Point, which sits in Iredell County, but Davidson Point is in the city limits. So uh, this neighborhood, as a reminder, was originally approved and built with the intention that it would one day uh, be served by Charlotte Water for its water service. When it was started, sewer was available. So these are customers in that neighborhood of Charlotte Water for sewer, uh, but water service was not available So at the time. So in the interim, what they did is built a community well system to provide uh, water service to the neighborhood. And the water lines were built to Charlotte Water specifications at the time in the neighborhood. So again, the intention was to uh, tap onto Charlotte Water at some point. And it was also made clear in the restrictive covenants for the neighborhood that Charlotte Water would uh, eventually be providing water service for that neighborhood. So those covenants were agreed on by property owners in Davidson Point when they purchased the homes. Additionally, connected to Charlotte Water does allow for residents in Davidson Point to only pay for water they, they are using rather than a flat fee currently system that's in place. And so, as was mentioned previously, in most cases, this will reduce some of water bills on average for many residents. It also turns a responsibility for the public water mains in the neighborhood over to Charlotte Water instead of the HOA. So uh, the neighborhood would, re would receive improved fire protection as a result of this line extension and connection to Charlotte public water. 
This was discussed at length by the interim fire chief at the last meeting and also uh, by decommissioning this well site. So Davidson Point was planned with the homes that are existing there today, plus there's another track where the well site exists and that was uh, to be a phase two. And so that phase two is proposed with 22 single family homes. And so that was the original intention of the neighborhood was to ultimately decommission that well site and then put residential on that remaining lot. And so that was referenced in the neighborhood covenants as well, that that would be transitioned to residential. So this phase two of 22 units uh, has been on the town's website since 2018 when it was originally approved as a potential addition to that neighborhood. So through this process, in terms of engagement, the town and Charlotte Water, they've done, a, done an awful lot in terms of reaching out to the Davidson Point community and providing opportunities for feedback. And even with the process being complicated by the pandemic, we really tried to go and do create a robust process and even in virtual settings. And we feel like we've done that. And so we've uh, created some additional opportunities as well since that last meeting. So just looking at the touch points from the past year with public meetings, we've had uh, two uh, public meetings by Charlotte Water, one Davidson Point neighborhood meeting by the town, three town board meetings before tonight where we discussed this project. And then of course, multiple monthly public comment opportunities at town board meetings over these last 12 months, as well as email and other opportunities to provide feedback. So attached to the agenda, we've put a timeline that did, does talk about those engagement points. So that's a new document since our last meeting. So that's attached. And then we also created an FAQ document that answered some questions from Davidson Point residents, particularly from the last a virtual neighborhood meeting where we did that. So that's attached to the agenda as well. So I want to point out those two new documents since our last meeting. And we'd like to acknowledge the feedback we've been receiving from Davidson Point uh, residents. There's been several emails coming into the board and to the clerk. And so those, those have definitely been read and taken into consideration. So I did want to mention that. Also at the last meeting, after that meeting, there were some comments about uh, not having the opportunity to uh, provide some feedback at that public comment period. So I did email the HOA to say, please send your questions my way and we'll answer those. And so we did receive one question. So I wanted to uh, talk about that tonight. It is The question is, one of my concerns is about switching to Charlotte Water is the increased cost that I would expect. My husband and I have lived there for six years and our monthly water bill has never been higher than $38. The wastewater bill is $45.97. Do you have any data for an average billing in Davidson for a family of two? So Charlotte Water was uh, helpful and provided an answer. While Charlotte Water does not track household size specifically, they estimate that a person uses about 60, 70, 60 to 70 gallons per person per day, which is about five uh, CCFs for two people per month. So that comes out to about $53.32 per month. So as you can see, that would be a projected reduction from what uh, this question, the questioner is asking in terms of what they typically pay. So as a reminder about costs, that was asked early on as well. And Charlotte Water uh, did provide an answer about on average users in the neighborhood would save roughly about $17 per month. And so that question and answer is in the FAQ document that's attached to the agenda. So I did wanna point that out as well. One other uh, topic related to this that, is, that we've talked about is this uh, proposed boundary or annexation agreement between the town of Morrisville and the town of Davidson. We talked a little bit about that at the last meeting and uh, really kind of the bottom line on that is, you know, we have annexation agreements, which is, really a way to have good fences and good neighbors. And we have those agreements with communities to our east and to our south, but not to our north with Mooresville. And so we've been having those discussions about uh, figuring out what makes sense. And some of what uh, drove that is where will util utility services be provided and by whom? So a lot of that was driving whether Charlotte Water would provide or town of Mooresville and what would make sense in terms of future growth area. So we worked on that. Our comprehensive plan uh, alludes to these, this future growth area that has been uh, outlined in this proposed boundary agreement. 
which is generally south of Bridges Farm Road and along Highway 115 would be considered future Davidson. And so that, that's been identified in our comprehensive plan with, with all the public feedback that kind of went into that. And so what we've talked about there is potential growth along there and uh, possible future employment center growth. So that's what's been identified in the comprehensive plan and what we've talked about to date. And uh, so uh, this was first discussed, this agreement at the February 11th, 2020 board meeting when we were talking about the waterline extension. So just want to uh, put that out there. The way I look at this, this boundary agreement, this is a growth management tool. This is a way to gain some control over of these areas of future Davidson. And through that, it then really dictates the ability to, uh, through water and sewer extension, through annexation and through zoning, to be able to, to uh, really put the growth of what we'd like to see there. And through those processes, there are public input opportunities that would happen as we go forward. So annexation, zoning, all those things, there are more opportunities for public comment on that. So the thinking to this point has been, let's determine if we're gonna extend this line. And if so, if the board were to decide that, then that would then say, let's go forth and finalize the proposed boundary agreement. And there's a process for that with more input opportunities. So that was the, the thinking there in terms of, of where we were going on that. So that would be our next thinking is come forward with that after, after a decision about this line extension. And finally, just as a reminder, commissioners are looking at these extensions through the water and sewer extension policy, and that's attached to our agenda too. And I think, you know, the way to think about this that, that, I, that I have is really, yes, it's a line extension that goes to Davidson Point and it serves existing customers that are already in the city limits. And then what would happen is there would be 22 more units because that is what's in Davidson Point already in the city limits. And so that really would be the direct uh, result of extending that line. However, it yes, there would be indirect results by running that line, then there would be those additional properties that would be considered future Davidson south of Bridges Farm Road that would uh, then be in position to be developed at some point. So there's no, no doubt about that. So I am looking at the water sewer policy based on the 22 units. And I think the way I'm thinking about the rest of the properties is uh, some of those single lot, some of those one, kind of one-offs, those uh, potentially are going to be ex uh, connections and very low impact. And so I don't see there being a major you know, impact with that. Really the 80 acres, that's the one that is the one that everybody is really looking at and has the most impact. And that's the large property south of Bridges Farm Road that's undeveloped. And so uh, the way we've been talking about that, and you all heard from the last meeting is, you know, if how, how what's going to happen with that parcel? And I think that's got what got folks kind of concerned. And, and so, you know, we can't say 100% guarantee on, on anything, but to develop that, it really is going to point towards it needing to be some type of extension that's going to come back to the town board. And an example of that is this, there's a sewer line out there now serving Davidson Point. And in order to tap onto that, it's, you're going to have to put in a pump station on that 80 acres. And so that there, thereby then becomes an extension. So that's just an example. There's several pieces like that that really point to that 80 acres coming back at a later date and that uh, that, that would be looked at through the water and sewer extension policy a different, at a different date. So, so coming back to the water and sewer policy, it really does focus on those 22 lots and just looking at the policy, uh, staff does not feel uh, that there's any undue burden on infrastructure, on the services, the natural environment, uh, on traffic based on those, those 22 units. But I fully acknowledge and recognize that other areas would open up for future development based on this line, line extending. So there's no, yeah, there's no doubt about that. So, so that's the quick summary on uh, what this topic is and the action before the board tonight, if you also choose, is to consider approval of the water line, Charlotte Water Water Line extension into Iredell County to the Davidson Point neighborhood as proposed. So I just want to put that out there that that's what that's about. Mayor, I'll stop there and uh, happy to answer any questions or call on our friends from Charlotte Water to answer questions. Yeah, hey, Jamie, I've got one quick question. Um, so I'm gonna make up a, a hypothetical um, scenario here on the, not the 80 acre parcel, but one of the other smaller parcels. I, I am a, hypothetically, I am a landowner along 115 
and I own 10 acres off of 115 that I now can have a connection versus an extension. I wanna put 20 single family homes on that 10 acre uh, plot of land. So half an acre home sites based on the annexation policy or based on you know what, what could potentially come up under our purview, would I be allowed to do that or would I have to rezone? Yeah, that's a, a good hypothetical question. And I think what comes into play there is uh, what type of public infrastructure would need to be built on that property in order to facilitate that type of development and what is the existing zoning for Iredo County. So I think that's, that's some of what comes into play. And really when you think about taking a 10 acre parcel and trying to do that many homes, you're talking about some type of roadway improvement. And then, then, I start, then you start to look at, it, it's gonna take some type of extension to be able to connect to the, the water and sewer line. And then I think there could be limitations with Iredell County zoning in terms of, of being able to develop. And so uh, you know, possibility exists that they would want to talk to the town of Davidson about having a different zoning on that property to, to consider some type of development. So um, that those will be the trigger points that would likely look at anybody doing some type of development like that would want to come to the town of Davidson and Charlotte water to be able to do that. But, but it move, if it moves off of Iredell County's under, if it moves out from underneath their purview and onto ours, it would, would it come to the board of commissioners or would it not come to the board of commissioners for review? Uh, it, it would come to, to the board of commissioners, particularly for the zoning on it. So, and, and then it could come to you as an extension as well under our water and sewer extension. So even if it weren't an extension, if it were only a connection, there's still a check and balance in place that says this isn't, this isn't going to turn into a free for all, even on the smaller parcels. Yeah, there, that's the that's the tough part about the hypothetical. But uh, depending on what other regulations are in place, what they could do there, that that's what would dictate it. And so certainly coming to town of Davidson on zoning and utilities would uh, allow the town to have some say in what could develop there. But to be clear, Jamie, on one thing, the the I think the biggest angst that a lot of people have is that 80 acre parcel. And regardless of, of where that goes, if it goes to a business employment campus or if it were to go, uh, if the, the owner of that decided he wanted to go residential with it that's going to be an extension regardless, not a connection. It likely would. And the one example of the sewer is one. And I think if you start getting into building public roadways in there to be able to develop that, then you're talking about potential water line extension through there as well. So it could be water or sewer. So, um, so yeah, that, that's the ability to have some kind of control over those future Davidson areas through that. But currently, he's got Iredell County zoning, and if he wanted to, he could say, I've got 80 acres, I want to put 40 houses on two acre lots with well and septic, and Iredell County would say, sure, there's tax base for us, and then we've got the potential for 40 failed wells leaching into Lake Davidson. Yeah, that, that is right. There's Iredell County zoning on it now that's residential that they could pursue well and septic for that and as, as to this point they have not. I know a lot a lot of the determinant on that besides the fact that we would control the, the extension process will be that boundary agreement as well. Um, so uh, I know that these are two different entities that, that are, are, are we're talking about. One is the Charlotte Water Extension and the other one is a boundary agreement. Uh, with Morsel that, that you know, uh, is a newer dialogue. I think this water extension has been from the inception of the neighborhood. Uh, this has been on the, uh, the master plan. And, and this, I, I think uh, the, a, a lot of the, the comments I've seen uh, maybe we're, we're misguided in, in some aspect because 
this project all along was supposed to have public utilities. Yet this was the first opportunity to bring water to that site in 20 years. There's, there's never, I know it, it goes into a, a, a hopper and I think David or Angela, either one of you could address that, but this project came in queue where we had the opportunity to do it now and that opportunity has never been there. I've seen the comment about, we had the same worries about fire protection 15 years ago. Why are you worried about fire protection now? Well, this was our first opportunity to extend water. Um, am, I, am I correct? There. David, do you want to touch on that? Yeah, I can. And I would say that that is a, a fair assessment. It's uh, it's one project out of about 120 in our capital uh, program uh, that gets reviewed every year. And there were some other considerations with the with this particular portion, this phase of the, the Iredell County portion of this water main. Um, we needed to make sure that we had the robustness to the rest of our system on the Mecklenburg County side. And, and do some assessment work and a lot of studying and engineering. Uh, that's the work that's in progress now, most of which is complete that takes it up to the county line. And so until that work could get completed, there was no opportunity there. Um, but then higher level than that, bigger picture, you're correct. We have um, a, a capital program that's uh, close to $300 million a year of expenditures, but we have needs that exceed that and we have to prioritize that every year uh, and this was, well, a couple of years ago was when this project, the, the Davidson water uh, improvements rose to the top of that. And we started construction on the, the pieces on the Mecklenburg County side. Comments, commissioners? Jamie, I thought one other thing that might be helpful, again, there are so many documents that were available for tonight, but again, not overlooking the fact that um, you've mentioned several times, but the community um, documents, the registered documents, um, they were registered in February of 2006. It does have the very specific language um, in those documents for the community. And those are the ones that, that we've been referencing, but we could surely put a link on there. I will say that it might be confusing to some, the document that is there that is available um, has a watermark on it that says that it's unofficial, but the front page of it is the one that was recorded with the Iredale um, records and deeds. Um, and it specifically goes in to the discussion of the future development of the 1.93 acre parcel. Um, it does specifically talk about the community water system and the intent for a um, you know, company such as Charlotte Mecklenburg Utility, which was the name at the time, to operate that system. So there's very clear delineation in the documents that are part of every homeowner's buy-in um, to a neighborhood that have been part of that discussion. Um, so I, I look at it that from that way. Um, I will also say that, uh, again, to the point where people were questioning, um, you know, that this is now a safety issue. I thought um, Acting Chief Monteith made a terrific um, presentation um, last month at our meeting. And um, I just have to say, I mean, I cannot overlook the fact that you know, at least one of the hats that I wore during a portion of my time in my Navy career was an extensive amount of firefighting training, um, shipboard firefighting training, aircraft firefighting, you know, being in charge of teams of, of firefighters. Um, I look at this and I do not apologize for the fact that I see this as a significant safety issue. And the comparison that I made to someone the other day was that I think that a lot of good folks um, were well-intentioned and came up with a suitable, viable plan to allow firefighting capability in the Davidson Point community with this additional redundant system piping out of um, the pond. I'm comparing that to that small little spare tire that some folks have um, in their car. It's not a full-size tire, but it's a spare tire and it will get you to where you need to go. 
we now have the opportunity, as David just alluded to, this is the first opportunity with the redevelopment or the installation of a main of um, significant size to bring the water pressure needed up to the county line and then with the extension into Iredell County that could take it to Davidson Point. I personally, I will not apologize for the fact that I would take it upon myself that if we did not do this and that there was a fire in that community, everything that Chief Monteef said, and I call on him if he wants to, to say anything different, presupposes that we are able to flow two companies are two trucks to get into that location and one on scene and one operating to pull um, water out of that pond. It scares me. Um, and I just, I personally cannot overlook that in addition to knowing that the development of the 1.93 acres is specifically delineated in the, the covenants and the deeds that were signed off by everybody. So I will continue to say that this is a safety issue and on the point that we've made about additional development beyond the 1.93 acres, those are things that will still come back to the Davidson down board when it is a Davidson issue and you need, and we should hold ourselves accountable for making each one of those decisions in a fair, thoughtful and concerned manner as we would with any other decision. Autumn. Sure, um, I actually prepared a couple of comments just to make sure that um, I said what I wanted to say. Um, and I thank the community. I know we have a lot of listeners here and we've received a lot of emails. Um, and I wanna thank the community who have shared their thoughts with us both for and against the proposal. Um, I keep thinking to myself, first do no harm. <laughs> Um, and this is, seems to be one of those unfortunate decisions that has competing public policy choices and potential unintended consequences in terms of fire safety versus the potential for encouraging future development based on the water extension. And as the uh, mayor and uh, Jamie said, sewer is already, uh, sewer extensions already occurred there. So according to the sewer and water policy, the standard of review for this sort of decision is based on the initial policy statement of determining what's in the best interest of the community and then using the rationale um, of factors such as traffic congestion, the existing natural environment, health and safety concerns of citizens, and the burden on existing infrastructure. infrastructure. Um, given the fact that the 22 houses in the master plan were previously approved to be built on the site, uh, and subsequent to this water extension, I then run those 22 units through the lens of the potential for the increased traffic congestion, any loss of trees, though I think this is um, in that existing field uh, where the trees are already gone, um, any burden on existing infrastructure, et cetera. Um, so it seems sufficient for me to think that the water extension is one that won't have an, uh, an overly burdensome impact on the neighborhood or community when considering those potential 22 units. However, I'm very sensitive to some of the neighbors' concerns about the possibility of the water extension either intentionally or unintentionally making it easier for future development there that can't currently be captured with the policy in terms of impacts. And that really gives me pause. Um, I think again, first do no harm. However, I then think about our uh, previous fire chief and our current interim fire chief's comments about his concerns about fire protection in the neighborhood with houses so close together and under, his current, under the current system. And to me, the need for optimum fire safety must outweigh my fear of escalating future development in the area. Uh, and thinking about what's in the best interest of the community as a whole, as well as the safety concerns of the citizens per the policy, the sewer and water policy, um, I, I'm looking now in favor of the water extension, even as I recognize and even worry about any unintended consequences um, of that potential extension. But I, I just couldn't live with myself if there was a fire in Davidson Point next year or two years or five years down the road. And, and we were the ones who said no to adequate um, fire protection there. Then I really have to say first do no harm. Um, 
So that's the basis of my comments. Thank you. David? So I have a couple of questions then for um, Autumn, you and Jane. Um, if, 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 there was a, if there was an alternative that was equally as safe or perhaps safer, would it change your mind? What's your what's your hypothetical, David? I mean, I'm I'm looking at what's again. An, there are written documents which said that which every homeowner has signed on to that says that they intended for the water system to be taken over by a utility. It was the premise for what ours was done. So now at this, what is an eleventh hour in a decision making process for us with Charlotte Water as they're moving forward with this. I, I don't see that there is another viable option right now, and I'm going to err to where I've already stated my opinion. Yeah, so my question was, if there wasn't a viable alternative that was safer. And I'm asking if you have that you, viable you, alternative that's available your right your now. Would you change your outcome? Would you change your outcome? I don't know of a viable opportunity or another thing that you're talking about. So if you can present us with a plan and a viable option that is available today or within the next month, please present it. Because the, the, the reason why I asked the question is, is that I want to make sure that it's about safety, Jane. I, I asked that question and you immediately went to the of 23 years ago. So I, I want to make sure that the issue is safety. It's a combination for me, and okay. what I understand. So it's, so it's, changed. Account. it's changed a little bit now. Okay. Safety is a paramount issue, but I also cannot overlook the fact that the recorded documents that are on record state that the developer intends to move forward with this. So to me, it's hand in hand, but I think Autumn was, was far more articulate in her measure of comparing that we are the board that is tasked with the option that now exists to extend Charlotte Water. And therefore that makes it our decision. So one, one of the questions I asked in the last meeting was, was, were there any alternatives? And I didn't get any answers. Um, um, but there, seem, there seems to be uh, at least some options. And, and you know, I think that what I would like to see is, is, uh, is the chief, um, what options are out there, right? So we know that there are fire suppression tanks that are used when there's not municipal water supply that they can tap uh, to buy time uh, uh, instead of pulling directly from the lake and the delay that that happens. So, you know, the, the question is, ha have these alternatives that are out there when municipal water supplies don't exist, ha have, have they been vetted? Um, as far as I know, they haven't been talked about on this forum. And so, so, the, so that's one question. The other, the other question is, when we talk about safety, I assume we mean safety, uh, not just fire safety, but, but, but safety, period. So you, you said, Jane, you, you wouldn't be able to live with yourself, or maybe it was you, Autumn, I'm sorry, uh, if, if there was a fire and uh, we, we hadn't passed, and I, I agree. Um, the question is, if, if we pass this and, and the development propagates along 115 and Bridges Farm Road, as we've alluded to here, and we don't have a viable exit corridor in this congestion, and fire trucks on because they're stuck in traffic, will we feel the same way? What we know is, is that when someone has a cardiac event, we've got four minutes, four minutes to respond. If we get there in four minutes, we've got a reasonable shot at saving their life. Every minute after that, it goes down in diminishing increments significantly. What's the probability of a cardiac event? 
if it's a point as opposed to uh, a fatality from a fire. So my question here is, have we, have, if, if we're arguing safety, have we, have, we, have we fully looked at this in terms of the safety impacts? And have we weighed those against them? We hadn't talked about development with respect to this decision until the end of last, last meeting. I'll, I'll tell you what, what bothers me the most about this is that the request from the people at Davidson Point has largely been not to change your decision. To say, we don't feel like we have been adequately heard. And we're asking you for a few more weeks, a month, after 23 years. And I listened to Jamie's introduction here. And I heard only the reasons why we should pass this. I didn't hear any reasons why we shouldn't. And I can tell you there are always pros and cons. So why don't we talk about them? And when you don't talk about them, you undermine your credibility. We have this panel of folks here, all fine people, I'm sure. We've got staff, we've got this town board, we have the mayor, we have CMUD. I don't know where the other folks are from, but what, 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 what I notice is who is missing from this panel are the people from Davidson Point, or so from what I understand who have signed a petition who said they, they don't want it. So we're up here, we stack the deck, we say only the pros, avoid the cons. And we think we're having a real conversation. And this is a group that came in on the same issue not having real honest conversations. And here we are. So before you cast that, I would ask you to please consider that to give these folks a chance to be heard. Give Monteith a chance to say, yes, there are alternatives and they're adequate or they're inferior. And for us not to fall in the trap that the last group did. Matthew. Yeah, so David, I, I think, you know, I've read the emails that have come in and, I, and, and what I heard from the people were, you know, three basic things. And it wasn't asking for more time. It was um, concerns about water, Charlotte water quality versus the well water, uh, concerns about development, and a general uh, commentary about a lack of transparency. Um, I've reached out to citizens that were willing to talk to me. So uh, I feel like to say, hey, our voices haven't been heard. I've been here to listen and I can't chase every single person down that may have an opinion. So I, I think that that's an unfair statement, whether whomever is making it. Um, you know, I, I think first on the transparency side of it, you know, it, it, ha it has been in the works for quite, for quite a long time, right? And there's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. It's, it's indisputable. Um, similar to how the it was indisputable from a, the, the Clances on that Beatty was intended to be a park. And quite frankly, more legal documentation here than, than we had on Beatty Street. Um, so I think, um, you know, th this project has been 
in the works for a while. And for me, um, we can talk through the pros and the cons, right? The pros are uh, better fire safety for the residents of Davidson Point. Uh, the pros are, uh, you know, potentially lower cost, um, affordable water to the residents of Davidson Point. A potential con is development along the 115 corridor, uh, which also is gonna happen whether we approve Charlotte water or not, right? Iredell County um, is either gonna choose to run water down there or develop it with well and septic, which will create a different con, which is water quality of having a bunch of, if, if you have a bunch of well and septic uh, on that undeveloped property next to Lake Davidson, which would be not great. So, and I, and I think, you know, to me, there has been a lot of communications with the residents. There's been reaching out to the homeowners association board. And what I've heard from listening to the residents is that the neighborhood's divided. The neighborhood, there are, there are pe uh, residents within Davidson Point and surrounding Davidson Point that want Charlotte water coming in. And there are residents that are against it and they're against it for all those various reasons. Some are more against it because of water quality. Some are more against it because of potential development. And I think about the, the, the potential annexation or you know, what I'll call pulling the 100 plus acres under the town of Davidson umbrella versus Iredell County. And I, I'd prefer to be in the driver's seat when it comes to the decision-making process of what that 100 acres is. And I would really like us to, um, hold on one second, sorry, it got. While Matt stepped away, I will acknowledge that Commissioner Fuller has joined the meeting. Hey, sorry about that. My, my five-year-old wanted to come in. Um, but I, I think uh, the joys of Zoom versus in-person meetings, right? Um, you know, and so I think about all of those things. And, and so I think that there's some potential solutions. So what are some alternatives? Um, and by the way, I haven't, I haven't heard from citizens offering up potential solutions, right? And when I think about some of the things that, that I tried to do when I was a citizen, when I was unhappy about things, I, I came with solutions, not just presented problems. So one, one potential solution on the water quality is, is that if you are really concerned about the quality of the water, uh, and this, this is from listening to the citizens that, that haven't been heard, um, is that there's reverse osmosis filtration units that you can use that will filter out all of these issues. And Davidson Point is currently in negotiations with the, with the developer on how much money is gonna come back into the homeowners association. It's gonna be at least $80,000. Uh, I think if you ask the Davidson Point HOA, they'd say it's probably closer, needs to be closer to 120. But each one of these units costs about $200 a piece. So if you double that, including installation, that's call it 60 to $65,000. Uh, for any, any resident within Davidson Point that would want a reverse osmosis filtration system installed in their house to alleviate any concerns about water quality. Uh, and that can be funded through this fund. And again, that's between the residents and the HOA, uh, but it would be my recommendation if I were sitting on the HOA board, I would say anybody who wants one, we're gonna use this fund to make sure that they have it. Um, I, think, I think another thing that can be done is, is that if, if you're concerned about the water, stay, staying with the water quality, if uh, Charlotte Water is, if, if you're concerned about the reliability of Charlotte Water's testing, and Gina, thank you for, for being on, um, make, have an independent third party come out and test that water quality concurrently with Charlotte Water, have both results be made public and compare any discrepancies. Uh, so to me, I think those are two viable solutions that, you know, we can, we can push the homeowners association to do to try and help ease the concerns about the water quality. Um, you know, I think, I think as we look at the, the development side, I'm going to, I'm going to stay with it, which is, Hey, if it's a hundred acres, that's going to be decided by this board 
and, and we can go through the process of doing a small area plan as, as Jamie had mentioned. Uh, I don't wanna just, you know, accept this property and then morph it into neighborhood general or neighborhood edge. I'm not interested in that. I think we should do a small area plan. And I think having a small area plan done drives public engagement. The residents of Davidson Point, the residents of North Main Street, everybody that, that can and will be impacted by development is gonna have a chance to come and have their voice be heard. Small area plan, and, and Jamie, I don't think we should do it saying, hey, we're thinking it's a work center, we're thinking it's this, no. Blank slate, come in and say, what do y'all want this to be? And, and get citizen input and drive citizen engagement and let us, let us as the town of Davidson be responsible for how we are gonna grow and how we're gonna manage that growth and, and put it on us. And I feel better, I always feel better making the decision than letting somebody else. And so that's not about Iredell County, it's not about the town of Mooresville, it's not about anything else. I always feel better making the decision. Um, and I think, that, I think that we have an opportunity here and it's, it's an ancillary benefit, but I think it's a benefit. I think it's a really valid benefit. Um, and, and you know, I'm not gonna sit and beat the drum on the fire safety because I think Jane and, and Autumn you know, said it clearly, but I mean, it goes without saying that um, we do have a safety issue and we've been lucky for the last 15 years. And I'm not willing to sit here and roll the dice with people's lives and people's personal property to say, you know, well, we're just gonna kick the can down the road. <clears throat> I just don't feel comfortable doing that. And so for me, it's a yes, and it's a yes on the fire safety. And it's actually a yes because of development, but not to develop. It, it's a yes so that we can be in control of our own destiny. But, it's, but that is not the primary reason. The primary reason for me as one of five is safety. Thanks, Matt. Mr. Fuller, welcome. Yes, sir. I apologize. This has been an event that has been scheduled for months and months, or I would not have come in late. Well, your presence is acknowledged, and your your comments are are awaited. We we are currently on. Uh, well, I have I have thought a lot about this read a lot about this. Uh, generally speaking, uh, much of my philosophy is live and let live. However, um, there's one area where I think it is irresponsible to the point of criminal for government to be passe. And that's safety. I trust our acting fire chief, as indeed I trusted the last fire chief. Uh, to, to me, to borrow from one of my political heroes, as I am wont to do, Harry Truman said the buck stops here. And I think the buck on safety stops with us. It is not a question to me of whether there are simply alternative approaches, but whether there are alternative approaches that are as good as or better than having Charlotte water in the event of a fire and heaven forbid that the fire should jump from building to building. And for that reason, primarily, I feel strongly, and by the way, I agree with Matthew, I'm not for development, but I am for having control over development. Jim, do you know the answer to that question? don't know anything more sophisticated than what we heard last time. I, as, as a is matter there, is, of is there... process, first of all, I, I would not object uh, to having a, another plenary session, uh, although I, I, I really don't hear a lot of new ideas. <clears throat> Most of what I've been reading is a 
a, a truncated notion that we're not being transparent, which I think is patently incorrect. Uh, but I wouldn't mind setting aside a, a, a reasonable period of time and listening to people and seeing if we're if I and we are missing anything. And I certainly wouldn't mind asking uh, the acting chief to let us know if there are indeed alternatives that are equally or more safe. So no, no David, I, I can't give you a concrete answer on that. I think that's all all those folks are asking for. And, and just 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 one one point of clarification. Uh, I don't think there's any I think we're conflating this issue of boundary agreement and sewer and water extension. I don't I don't think I don't think that they're tied together. I mean, if 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 so if water is not extended uh, I don't think it precludes us having a boundary agreement and vice versa for that matter. So uh, let's be careful to not, not to conflate that issue. Well, ju just to be clear, the boundary agreement was partly predicated on future utility service areas. So you're right, we can the agreement today without the utility service, but the logic here was we we wanted to at least determine where Charlotte Water could and was willing to serve, and also what Mooresville was willing to serve and just see where that shook out. And so that helped inform the boundary agreement. So I, I just want to clarify that. No, that's that's fair, right? There, there, there's, some, there's some topographic issues between here and there they they should stop where they stop and we should go to where we are talking about going but I, I don't think there was ever the Jamie. indication i don't think there was ever the indication from mooresville that if we don't extend now that they, that, that they wouldn't uh agree to this boundary agreement so it, it it's it's don't we don't have we don't have to have one to necessarily get the other one Jamie, I think if the primary objective was to get the boundary agreement in place, David, that would be a valid point. But that, to me, isn't what the primary objective is, right? It, well, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what that is, Matt, because it keeps changing. To, for me, or I've heard, I've heard, I've heard covenants. I've heard, I heard safety for a year, and then when, now we're talking about covenants and development patterns, and we don't want to talk about what the safety concern is for congestion on 115. So it's it's only, it's only, it's only, it's only safety to the extent that it gets us what we want. So you've heard safety for a year, but not enough public input. What do those have to do with any? I have one jealous? question, which I hope is not repetitious. Uh, is there any reason born of fact to think that the water provided to Davidson Point would not be safe like the water provided to everybody else in this town and uh, several other towns. I mean, is this a legitimate factual concern or is it just a manufactured argument? Uh, Commissioner Full, I'll, I'll answer, and then David can answer. In my view, no, I do not. I do not have any concern with the water provided by Charlotte Water. The folks in Davidson and the rest of Mecklenburg County are drinking it now, so I feel very comfortable with that. So, uh, that that's my view on it. David, would you? Have anything? I, I would absolutely. Well, that's comforting because I got a cup of it right here, and it tastes pretty good. I would agree with that. Um, you know, we conduct daily sampling, a uh, quarter of a million tests a year. We would propose to include two additional sampling stations along this line going out towards Davidson Point. Uh, and the water that will, will go up into Iredell County will be the same water that everybody throughout the county is drinking that is, um, that is absolutely excellent quality. Hey, Jim, can I, can I chime in? Because I, I had a good conversation with one of the one of the residents of Davidson Point that was kind of championing that and I think you know I think I think it all depends on perspective right um, the the particles in the water meter exceed EPA guidelines 
federal federal government guidelines handed all the way down to where we are today, right? Top down. Um, just like I think that there are people that'll tell you that 5G cellular service is harmful for you. Having a cell phone to your head is harmful to you. Watching too much TV, standing too close to a microwave while it's cooking. I'm, you know, just throwing a bunch of stuff out there, but it's, it's valid. I think it's valid to a point, right? Which is in a, in a perfect world, there would be zero particulates and we wouldn't have to chlorinate our water and clean it. And, um, but I think to that same point, I'm drinking Charlotte water. My kids drink Charlotte water. And so I think that, I think that those citizens are genuinely concerned about the quality of the water. And I don't think that it's, it's just a facade. And I think that the, the reason why I, I was coming up with the recommendation of the reverse osmosis filtration is that same resident. I asked the question, I said, well, I get filtered water out of my refrigerator. Does that solve the problem? And, and the answer was no. And I said, is there anything out there that does solve that problem? And they said, yes, these reverse osmosis filters. So I think for the, for the citizens that are genuinely concerned that have, that have, real issues with Charlotte water, even though it meets all standards, I think that there's a reasonable alternative and a solution that can be put in place that we're, we would have to rely on the homeowners association, but I think it's, it's a pretty fair solution to the problem. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, think, I, think, I think the experts on the panel would say, you know, look, all, all things equal, uh, uh, municipal water has to be treated uh, typically to a greater extent than well water does. And the way that city water gets treated is, is that you add chemicals to it. And what we understand is, is that in the mass aggregate metadata calculations that it seems to be acceptably safe. You know, to, to Matt's comment, you know, I think, I think, I think you're right, Matt. I, I, I do think that they are genuinely concerned. And, uh, you know, you know there's, 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 a, there's a reasonable, rational level of, of, of doubt with it. You know, in my house, I have a reverse osmosis filter. Uh, for the chlorine, for the fluoride, uh, some of these things where there's some questions around long-term use. I, I, I don't know the answer to it. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's a trumped up issue as, as, as the question was. Well, somebody ponder me this. Is it true or false that well water must be regularly tested and occasionally treated with chemicals? Absolutely. As, as formerly living in, in the county and having a well, no doubt you had to dump chemicals in your well periodically. Uh, no doubt you had uh, particulates and a, a larger amount of sediment uh, in your well water than you did in uh, uh, treated city water. I look at the screen, there's 13 of us on here. I think 12 of us are drinking city water right now at our homes. Um, you know, I, I, for me, I, I personally would rather have that treated water than the well water. Everybody talks about how good well water is. Well, you've punched a hole 300 feet down through a rock shelf to get an artesian well, but you don't know how much runoff and things like that uh, has seeped through uh, the ground and through the water table to leach through the rock and mantle shelf that takes you to that artesian well that you're drinking drinking out of at your house right now. And these, these are more harmful chemicals like formaldehyde from foam rubber and things like that that uh, uh, will leach into that that artesian well, if you will, where your, your well water's coming from. So uh, for me, I still feel that 
municipal water is a safer route to go. I, I grew up on well water, I, and I can tell you, we never we never added any any chemicals to it. Now maybe we should have, um, but but we certainly never never did. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, you know, there there are certainly some vulnerabilities to to well water. Uh, look, look at look at Huntersville. They they that, that gas line leaked is still leaking. Is Close session at the end. We've got today. a small city set set up over there trying to deal with it, and uh, that just came on. Any confirmed cases? That's where you click in. Confirmed cases, hear you. Confirmed cases uh, uh, of 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 the gas leaking into the water table, but but they're testing, and and it is a concern. So it, it yeah. you can poison, you can poison the well. Hence the term, but it, I mean, look, I, I think, I don't, I don't feel strongly one way or the other, Charlotte water versus well water. One is way better than the other. I think there's risks involved in both. Uh, I've never, I grew up on a septic tank, but, but not well water. Um, but I knew I had a lot of friends that did and sometimes it needed to be treated. Sometimes it didn't. Um, but again, I think, I think we have, I think there's a, there's a, there's a solution that's out there that can, that can solve the concerns of those individuals that, that truly have it. But I think on that issue, I think we would all agree that the folks at Davidson Point should choose for themselves, right? I mean, you may do the safety issue of a rides and they don't get to choose that. Okay. Uh, but on, on, on whether or not you consume something, I mean, that, that should be, that should be up to the individual. Yeah, and, and David, you chose, right? And and you made the investment yourself. And I think there's a solution here where they can choose and not have to make the investment. Well, I choose by virtue of living in Davidson, right? No, but you, cho you cho I'm saying you chose the reverse osmosis filtration unit. Mayor, we had this up, I believe, as an action item. So we could continue talking about some of the same issues, but if we're ready to move forward with a motion, um, I'm ready to make a motion that we move forward with approving the extension for Charlotte water that would serve the Davidson Point neighborhood. Just, just, just before we jump into that, you know, I'd like to join uh, Commissioner Fuller's comment and his willingness to have the chief uh, see if there's any alternatives out there and to, uh, and to at least give this a 30 day stay to have 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 this conversation about is this in fact the safest option and are there alternatives? Well, I'm happy to add the chief to the conversation and if he knows of something right now um, and says, yeah, we in 30 days I can come up with a solution or then then I would say that makes sense, but delaying it 30 days just to delay it 30 days is not I and I don't know that we have 30 days with where we are with the process. I mean, we're, we're at a year out from where we started this conversation and anybody who's driven up Sloan or Beatty or been at the intersection of Griffith and any of those knows that the project is moving forward. So we have a juncture where we need to make a decision. So um, I stand with making my motion um, I'm happy to have Chief come on. Can we can we get my ch ch the Chief on? We can. Uh, does, is that what the board wants us to do? We can bring him in from the wing. Sure, bring Ryan in. Okay, Betsy, if you wouldn't mind bringing the Chief in. Hey, Chief. Good evening. So we're discuss have you been on, have you been listening to discussion? Yes, Mayor, I have. Okay. So the, the, the question has been brought up of, is there a alternative or safer method for fire prevention than, than what ultimately we will, will have, uh, at our hand if, if water is extended to Davidson Point? 
Yeah, I think I think the question is is you you know are are there are there other ways to deal with this issue? I mean, cause, so we currently deal with it by dropping dropping the uh, a line in the lake today. Is that right? No, so we've got a hard line um, metal pipe that extends into the so, same thought process commissioner sitting. It's just an actual attached pipe that runs from the street level back down through to the pond itself. And it's all, it's always there. And, and the issue the issue is 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 the lag time or or the pressure or both. As far as what our what our current capabilities are not at, or what's the issue with the redundant system that we have to utilize? Yeah. What? Why? Why? Why is it not as safe as what was being proposed here? Well, I'll give you I'll give you two uh, thoughts on that. Uh, my first is when we pull up to a residential fire or any building fire for what that matter is, we've got a very specific game plan that we're trying to utilize. Now that game plan may change as we go throughout, but the, the principles behind it are very basic. And the first one is we've got to get a water supply established. We've got to have water coming into us. Um, so whether that is utilizing tanker shuttles, bringing the tank, bringing the water with us out in the ETJ area, or hooking up to a municipal hydrant that's on Main Street at Main and Concord, we've got to be able to supply a patent water supply to our engine companies because they carry limited. Um, if our if our main hose lines are deployed off the truck, those can produce anywhere from 150 to 180 gallons a minute. I have a 500 gallon water tank on engine one. So if we do the math, I'm gonna be out of water in about two and a half minutes if I don't have that patent water supply established. In some of the emails that I have responded to, I have, I have agreed with the residents of Davidson Point that yes, they have a fire protection, excuse me, fire protection system in place that the ETJ does not currently have. I have to bring the water with me out there. But I go back to however, in the ETJ, I do not have residential homes that are sitting 10 feet apart on a side setback, which is what we currently have. If you look on the inner ring on the Bridges Farm. Um, now that gets a little bit more spaced out if we get out Lavender Bloom Loop. Um, some of the space, side, uh, side setbacks are a little bit deeper than that. Um, so to, to be able to maximize the amount of pressure and water that we have available to us currently. We have to bring a second due company or a second due engine company and dedicate that apparatus and the personnel with that apparatus to that dry hydrant, which is located on Lavender Bloom Loop because one driver cannot do that by themselves. There's just, there's too many working parts involved in it. They have to take a hard suction tubing off the side of the engine company hook from that engine company to the hard to the dry hydrant and be able to pull a draft. That draft can take anywhere from 45 seconds up to two and a half minutes. It depends on the level of the lake. It depends on uh, if we have any air leaks in the pipe itself, which we have, we have experienced before. We've been able to, you know, address those issues, but it does occur. Then once that draft is established to that dry hydrant, and once we're getting water from the pond up to the engine company, then we have to take supply line and run it from the engine company back to the first primary hydrant that is adjacent to the first municipal fire hydrant that is on Lavender Bloom Loop that is adjacent to the dry hydrant. We basically have to run that line back to the municipal hydrant, open it up, run additional hoses to the two and a half outlets that are on the side of that hydrant and basically charge the system. And what that does is it takes that minimum from 200 and 250 PA or gallons per minute that's currently in the municipal hydrants. And it will some get us somewhere, if everything's working properly, in that 600 to 800 gallon per minute range. So for me, as your interim fire chief, currently sitting right now, I've been doing this 22 years, 20 years in the city of Charlotte, 14 years in the town of Davidson. I do not know of another system or another alternative that is currently out there that would be better than a pressurized system coming in from Charlotte Water. 
Commissioner Sitton, I'm if if Chief, I tell you hundred percent. Chief, let me try. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's your, your fact. He, here is my question as a pro I'm sorry, Commissioner Fuller, go ahead. As a practical matter, and realizing that you and your department and we and our board and senior staff are responsible to provide the highest practical level of safety. Is that in this instance, taking into account the number of homes and the closeness to go with city water? Yes. Thank you. Chief, are there any other neighborhoods in Davidson that are similar to Davidson Point in terms of well, well water um, or the, the situation that, that you're describing or is Davidson Point just a purple unicorn? Uh, Davidson Point is, a, is an interesting development for us in the town and that is currently within the town limits. Um, do we have some neighborhoods in the ETJ that does not have any water capability? Absolutely. Uh, Running Mead's a good example of that. Um, we've got, you know, pretty large, substantial homes over 3,500 square feet that's in that neighborhood um, that we do not have water to. We would have to tanker it to us. The, the benefit, I guess you could say, and this is where I don't like to compare the two neighborhoods together because we're not comparing apples to apples is if I go out to one of these neighborhoods in the ETJ, I don't have to worry about a side setback of a minimum of 10 feet. Um, yes, we may have a significant fire, but usually I'm gonna be able to capture that with the amount of mutual aid apparatus that I have coming as far as the amount of water that's coming with me. What I don't have to typically worry about is exposures, additional exposures in the ETJ area because we don't have them sitting so close together where my exposure issue is a con huge concern is for example, that inner ring at Davidson Point based on the side setback. And I provided some information that's on the Q and A form that discusses how ISO grades us on our water supply capability. And one, they have a full chart in there that we go off of that we utilize that specifically talks about minimum gallons per minute based on side setbacks. And that is factoring in exposures that are adjacent to your primary fire building. Um, so from my vantage point, when it comes to delivering the best fire protection that I can to you all and to the citizens of this town, my job is to make sure that I am giving you the information that I feel is correct and what is gonna be the best case scenario for this town moving forward. And from a fire protection standpoint, for those citizens in Davidson Point, what I'm telling you is that the ability to be able to bring in Charlotte water to pressurize that system even further and to have a more patent water supply to where I do not have to worry about any more utilizing that dry hydrant system is a win in my book. Chief, let me ask you a question. If, if you had a 20,000 gallon uh, fire suppression water tank on site in Davidson Point that you could hook to, that would give you, that would give you uh, what, 35 minutes, 40 minutes? Depends on the size of the lines that we're throwing, flowing commissioner yeah. sitting, but yes. Uh, what, what, why would that option be inferior to Charlotte Water? Is that tank pressurized? Uh, this is the question, right? The question is, what are the other options? And uh, are there any that is, are as good or superior? Commissioner Sitton, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't, I can't speak for any other pockets across the country because I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's another 
neighborhood in South Carolina or clear across the country in California that has a system similar to what we have. Um, if I told you yes or told you no, I wouldn't be transparent. Um, if, 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 if Davidson Point were to come to you and say, look, guys, we, we hear you. We, we want safety as a top priority. We're willing to pay to install a 20,000 gallon water tank, pressurized. It gets us to 600, 800,000 gallons per minute. Would, would we be concerned about that? Would we be opposed to that? Where are we getting that water once that water runs out? Well, presumably from the lake. And that, that, and that would be my question is, I still have to get the water coming from somewhere. If we run out of water, we run out of water. I have no capability to be able to get it back unless I tanker the water into me. No, I understand, but if the, if the delay time is 45 seconds to two minutes, you got more than enough time on a 20,000 gallon tank. To David, that water supply. Time out for one second. You're talking about a water tower, right? A two no, not, I'm not talking about water, water tower. Water tower. I'm not talking about a water tower. My, well, my point, if you're going to build something that has the capacity here. to hold 20,000 gallons of water, you're talking yeah. about building a no, dam. it's not a water tower. I, I'm sorry. That you've you can lost look it up. Capacity. My point, my you've, point we've is. We've entertained you long enough. You've lost my point. My point is, my point is, is not, is not to argue the mechanics. My point is to say, only raise the question, are there other options? If so, what are they? And present those again. If safety is the issue, if it's not, then well, we don't. David, David we don't you, have told, you brought Ryan on, and Ryan gave you what the fire chief gives you, which is the best option, the safest option. Is yeah, what, what we did. What we did was we we put we put we put the chief on the spot. Right. I asked for thirty days. I asked for thirty days to have this conversation. Matt said, "I'll do it tonight." So no, I did. We put him on the spot. So if if well if, we didn't put him on the spot, it's, it's, it's not me. It's not it's it's not me. It's not me that treated him unfairly in that way. Well, Chief, I, do you feel like you're going to be able to come back with a different answer in 30 days. Well, I don't apologize for putting the chief on the spot. That that comes with being the chief. What I'm saying is, I find his answer plausible and persuasive. A and I would expect that from somebody I respect as much as our, our current chief. Well, I think we, we go back to where we started. We have a motion on the table. Is there any more discussion? And a, and a request for 30 day suspension. All right, so My motion stands. Yeah, just to just to be clear, and Steve, I don't. So rules of procedure. There's a, mo, a substantive motion on the table, and if somebody wants to make a procedural motion to delay, that's that's a separate separate motion. So um, it's uh, a motion to amend or a substitute motion, and it would have to be voted on separately and first if it's made. That's said better than me, so yes. So David's motion to delay for 30 days would be have to be voted on first before the motion to approve. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah correct me, correct me, but David could make that procedural motion to delay 30 days and then we would need to deal with that first. Did I get that right, Steve? That is correct, yes. Procedure motion. I apologize, Steve. I didn't mean to be oh, uh, no, stepping on your shoe there. You are not. I'm happy you're here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, <clears throat> Commissioner Sitton. Can we also it. discuss the impacts on Charlotte Water as to what <laughs> that would do? Yes, we can. Uh, David, you want to take that or Angela, either one of you? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to, and, and thank you. So we have a contractor that is doing the work that you are, are seeing progressing through the town of Davidson. Um, and for various reasons, crews and material, they are awaiting an answer from us. Uh, they do have a, I guess, a deadline, if you will, to know the direction to proceed or not. Um, that 
that's, you know, they stressed to us that they needed that um, soon so that they could make decisions and, and move crews and order materials in. Um, I can't sit here and say that a week would, would matter a month. I, I'm not sure that they would be able to, um, to do that. I think it would have impacts to the project. Yeah, we had, we conveyed a you know, decision in March. So 30 days is too long. You know, if you wanted to make it two weeks to the next meeting as a, as a procedural motion, David, that like, that's about, that's about the best we could do. I'll, I'll amend to, to two weeks, the next meeting. All right, so the procedural motion by Commissioner Sitton is that we amend uh, the vote on the decision until our meeting on the 23rd of this month. Is that correct? I don't, I haven't looked at my calendar. Is that the right date? That's correct. So I'm going to call for a vote on this procedural amendment first. Commissioner Fort? No. Commis Mayor Pro Tem Campbell? No. Commissioner Michael? No. Commissioner Sitton? Yes. Commissioner Fuller? No. Okay, so that's four to one against the pr procedural change for a uh, delay till the 23rd. Now we have a motion on the table to vote to move forward with the water line extension project to Davidson Point. It was done by Mayor Pro Tem Campbell. I will call the roll. Again. Hold on, can I make a friendly amendment request? Rusty, before you do that, yeah. we make a friendly amendment okay. request uh, to also get staff to start working on uh, the process for a small area plan uh, for that for that piece of property um, in between Bridges Farm and, and kind of where our um, boundaries are so that when that comes over to the town of Davidson that we're ready to go on rolling something like that out and we have public input and a thoughtful process around a blank sheet of paper. Hey, Commissioner Ford, can I amend your amendment that really says, let's come back to you with some planning options to include small area plan or other, other ways to go ahead and proactively plan for that area to get at the same place. Does that work? Yeah, that's, that's fine. But just, just know I, I'm not really interested in us starting the conversation out with, well, we think it should be this, right? I want I want the citizens to have the input and have it be a blank slate. I don't I don't want to lead the witness. Um, okay, it makes sense. Just to be clear, the comprehensive plan is is are, is already is already out there. But from what I'm hearing is let's have robust engagement and hear what people think. And I think having the conversation that says this was discussed in the comprehensive plan here here are some options, but it's got to start from a blank slate standpoint, in my opinion, Jane. If you're if you're willing to amend the amendment of the amendment. Well, I think that's more of a directive than an amendment. Yeah, I don't know that. Do we need them to be connected? But know that our. Matt, do you want that to be an amendment to Jane's motion or do you want to give staff a directive to let's move forward with a small area study that engages the public? Yeah, I, the only what I was trying to do is connect the two to make sure that that staff and everybody else knows that the intent here is to do the two kind of along with one another. And I don't want to kick the can down the road and say, well, we always meant for this to happen and then nothing happens. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're going in a different direction. Right. We, we, could do, we could do it as two different if you wanted, just because I, I'm also thinking about the boundary agreement. I would like direction. I think the intent would be let's move forward on that as well. So maybe you could package that up as one action. Happy to table it until then, then. Okay, so it's right. like vote on the extension and then come back to Matthew's motion. All right, so we're gonna queue you up as soon as we vote on this, Matthew. So I'm gonna call a roll now on the motion that is on the table. Commissioner Fort? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Campbell? Yes. Commissioner Michael? Yes. Commissioner Sitton? No. Commissioner Fuller? Yes. All right, motion carries. Commissioner Ford, on you now. Uh, well, I'm gonna let Jamie tee it up and, and Jamie, you tell me how you wanna hear it or how you think it should be said. And, you know, I think 
I think you know where we want to or where I'd like us to go with this, at least. And um, let's talk about it. I'll toss it out here and see if it's acceptable. So uh, authorize motion to authorize staff to uh, move to the move forward with Morrisville on the process for the annexation agreement and also uh, work with planning staff on uh, plan public engagement op options to move forward with proactively planning the future Davidson area to include small area planning, et cetera, something to that effect. Does that make sense? It does. And I, I would again add the blank slate comment to that, right? Because I, I can't stress enough. I don't want staff coming to the public saying, okay, let's have public comment. What do you think of A or B, right? And makes the public feel like it's either A or B. It, it needs to be carte blanche, all the above. I hear you, Matthew, and what you're trying to do. And I, I have an appreciation for your intent, but I feel like given the comprehensive plan is there that that is um, difficult. We, I mean, that's fair. The comprehensive plan also said we should do things um, like, uh, uh, why can't I think of the, the term, the thing that's got everybody all up in arms in the rural area about uh, oh, uh, targeted conditional targeted conditional zoning. So uh, I think we reserve the right to listen to the comprehensive plan, but call audibles where see fit. It's like we can come back to you with some options on the planning because there are a couple of different ways to do this and maybe that would be helpful to have that discussion because it does there are you know there's different there are different ways to address what you're looking for so that would be helpful to me if we had that conversation coming up I'm happy to author so I'll make a motion to authorize staff to pursue the the boundary agreement and come back to the board with two or three options uh, including a small area plan with the intent that we are not leading the citizens into a choice of either or, and that they have, they feel like they have actual public input on what's gonna go in there. Is that, that's, is that an action item or do you just want a thumbs up from the commissioners that yes, that's, that is a directive to staff? I, I threw that out as like a proposed motion. So I'd say let's go ahead and vote it. And so then what, what Matt said, we're gonna vote on now. <laughs> I, I said I'd like to make a motion, so yes, I hope okay. <laughs> go forward with it. All right, Commissioner Fuller. Yes. Commissioner Sitton. I have a question. Uh, does it, will, will that will that analysis look at safety considerations and response times? Uh, no. So it, it would be, it was more analysis of the options, if I'm understanding your question, analysis of the options. Do, do, do we want it to? Uh, no traffic impacts, I guess, is the question. Well, but specifically traffic impacts to response times and its impact on safety. Mm -hmm. Well, what was proposed was how do we engage the community on what this future Davidson could look like from a land use planning perspective, and just those there's different options to do that. That's what I was uh, saying. Let's focus on that because that's really the first step. So, so to try and tie David's comment into to what you're saying, Jamie, I think as we go through that process of public engage, engagement, a pro or a con needs to be, or the we need to clearly define what the proposed option, if we say, hey, option A is this, the traffic impact is part of that as a pro and or a con. Right, yeah. so, that is, so that we are, David, to your point, that we are factoring that safety in. Not, not, not the leading indicator, just, just whether it's a plus or a minus. Well, no, I mean, I think when you do a traffic in impact analysis, it's going to give you a leading indicator, right? No, no, no. It's the, the determining factor of to do or not to do. Is my it needs to be part of the decision process. So only a piece of it. Only, only a piece of it. And further into the process, once you actually know conceptually what you want to do and what those land uses could be, and then what are the number of units, and you got to have some specificity before you can really do a traffic analysis. I mean, this is this is my point, though, right? We, we used safety 20 years ago. It's no big deal. We've got something that's sufficient, and we're going to roll forward. Come back 23 years later, and we say, no, we got to drive sewer and water in here because of safety issue. The exact 
opposite. Now we turn around 30 seconds later and we say on growth and development, safety is only a secondary issue. Well, D David, actually, Am I, am, I, am, I, am I the only one that sees the irony in that? Well, I don't think I said safety is the secondary issue. I think it is, it is a factor that we need to consider. I think the, the, But you just said 30 seconds ago that it was the sole determining factor. For the Charlotte Water Extension, yes. Correct. So to, not, to not, not now. To an existing neighborhood. It, look, in a perfect world, if... If I were sitting on the board in 2005, I would have never approved a development with a safety issue until they could have gotten water out there. But we weren't. But we're getting ready to approve it to tomorrow. That's not true. We're even we if are impact, even if go, even if the safety it. impact is negative, it's only a secondary issue. No, we're getting ready to go get citizens. Why can't why can't we say if we can say it here? Why can't we say, look, if we impact safety negatively, we will not develop. Why can't we say that? We just said and, it. Then okay, David, David, then one of one of my questions would be, you know, you go back to our video at the beginning of this meeting on the 2050 MTP, go back to even a discussion on a north-south um, uh, corridor. We had that discussion. The vast majority of people wanted to push the north-south connector all the way over to Cabarrus County. And I still remember that one of the conversations we had is look at the potential growth north of Davidson that we have no control over between Davidson and Mount Morn and what that growth is gonna be, the traffic you were already talking about on North Main Street, and yet we wanna look at the only additional north-south connector is gonna be in Cabarrus County because we don't wanna look at anything else. So if you wanna talk about an issue of potentially being short-sighted on 20, 30 and 50 year planning, it's the fact that right now you've got I-77, we are beneficiaries, and I, I say that in jest, of the fact that we have the blockage of Lake Norman that doesn't give us an alternate with 21. But what we are looking at, because we have shifted those discussions to, to look at that potential corridor all the way up to, to being NC3 in Cabarrus County, you will not have another North-South connector. So you're exactly right but have that conversation when we're having transportation too and understand what the implications are when we have those kind of meetings. Happy to, happy David, to. I'm happy on. to do it. I'm happy to do it. The question is, Jane, are you? David, hold on one second. The question is, hold Jane, on. are you willing to say hold on one second. no to hold development, on one second. to growth, if it's a safety concern? David, David, <laughs> excuse me. This conversation may go on a little bit longer than anticipated, and I would like to take this time to thank Angela and David and Gina for, for, for being with us tonight. I'm not sure that we need them any further in, a, in this discussion at this point. And, and I would like to, at this point, thank them for being here. Uh, and, Unless y'all want to wait in, wait into this conversation, feel free to. <laughs> Thank you all. Appreciate you being here. And Chief, Thank you guys so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thank you so much. All right. Chief's got to get back to work. So thanks, Chief Monty. Yeah, Ryan, thank you so much. Thank you, Chief. Okay, sorry, David. I didn't want to interrupt, but I just didn't feel that they needed to be on for the rest of the night. So I was I was I was done. All right, where are we? Jamie, you've got marching orders for for staff we're still, we're still in a vote oh we're still in a vote that's right okay yeah david did you have anything else to interject no my only my only question was whether we were willing to add safety as a determinant factor to the vote well it, it in in doing any kind of study uh whether it be uh, i i i think you're 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 predicating safety on development. One house could potentially change the dynamic for safety. Uh, but I, I think safety is inherent with any small area study for any plan that comes on, just like a TIA would be uh, or, or anything else. So I think that that's something that's weighed in just as a given. Uh, you, you can't approve a, a subdivision and your fire department says, 
hell, there's no way we can we can handle that. We don't have enough fire trucks and enough firemen. We don't have enough police. We don't have enough this. We don't have enough that. So I think that's always a factor inherently. Great. I'm not totally sure what the motion is, but I don't see any problem with adding something about and attendant health and safety issues or something like that. But a procedural question, if one person has already voted and the discussion had already closed, where are we? <laughs> Steve? Well, you, I think, no, you, I think you still take a vote on the motion. Right. So, we, the, so the mayor had gone to Commissioner Sitton for a vote. We had already passed the point of discussion, right. as I recall, and then it started into a conversation. Okay. Yeah, so you just go back. It was, it was a question. It was a question of clarification with respect to the motion. Did it include a safety determinant, as the last one did? So it was a question of clarification as to the motion. I think the I think the procedurally the, right now is it, is on the floor for a vote, Mayor. Okay. So at, at this juncture, I, I will I've called on Commissioner Fuller. I will call on Commissioner Sitton. As a point as a point of clarification, does it include a safety determinant or does it not? The motion that is on the floor, I don't believe specified uh, safety. It, it doesn't, but inherent in the planning process is all the issues related to development and planning and which includes safety, but it's not specifically spelled out. So sa safety will not be a determining solely determining factor with respect to whether and how we develop. Uh, not on, not with this, this next step of the planning and the motion, it's to proceed with some planning options to come back to the board and we'll discuss those options with you all. And then those issues of whatever we're considering for land development, it's where that's where safety and other issues will reside. I'll reconsider at that time. Then my answer is no. Okay. Commissioner Michael. Can you repeat the motion? I apologize. Matthew or Betsy, excuse me. You got it? Um, I, I have some notes. But I'll, 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 I'll restate. It was essentially to direct staff to uh, move forward with Mooresville uh, on an annexation agreement and input from citizens for proactive planning in the area. South of Bridges Farm Road. Being on the, the, the uh, input from citizens. Does that help? Do you have, want to add more? Autumn, you got that now? I think. <laughs> Matthew, is that your motion? Yeah, I mean, it's basically, hey, let's let's get going on this, getting getting this into our jurisdiction and let's make sure that we have a transparent, open and thoughtful planning process for this this parcel or this this area. Okay, so for that, yes. Mayor Pro Tem Campbell. Yes. Commissioner Ford. Yes. So that carries four one. Thank you. I think I think Commissioner Sitton's point about traffic and safety issues, et cetera, though, is something that we acknowledge and that staff can recognize that that's part of the discussion and going forward with this, right? I, I agree, absolutely. We've, we've heard it loud and clear. Yeah, I mean, it, it needs to be a primary concern in terms of response times as it always has been as we we're talking about the widening of 73 where NCDOT has come in and said, we hear you, but we're still gonna go do something different. Um, but but it, safety is paramount and we need to make sure that that is a key area of concern as we go into any planning process. Got it. Okay. Item C. Consider approval of the five-year pavement plan. We're gonna call on project manager Doug Wright at this time. Thank you, Mayor. It's 
So tonight's presentation is just a follow up on the uh, discussion we had at the February 23rd meeting um, about our five year paving plan. Also a review of our pavement survey, which we just got finished conducting. We conduct a survey every five years in which every block of street in town is ranked. And we use that and other things to guide our paving process. So uh, this is an abbreviated version of that presentation. So on February 23rd, I uh, showed you that our rate, our street ranking has increased from 75.6 to 85.4 as a result of the paving that we did in the last five years. Um, I also described a regional approach that we took in the last five years that was successful. Um, we divided the town into five regions and addressed the worst streets in every region. Um, so we are proposing to use the same approach this time in the next five years. Uh, those regions are north of Griffith. Uh, that's the region that includes Beatty Street, Watson Street, Delberg Street, et cetera. South of Griffith, uh, which is the region that includes uh, Jaton Street, uh, the historic West Side, um, Davidson Gateway Drive, uh, et cetera. Central Davidson, which is the older part of town. This is the college here. We don't do any of their streets. Uh, but this includes Larmer Road, Woodland Road, Spring Street. East Central Davidson includes the St. Albans neighborhood and the McConnell neighborhood. And then finally, the East Davidson, which includes uh, River Run, the Bradford neighborhood, uh, Westmoreland Farm, uh, et cetera. So those are the five regions that we're proposing to work in on a region by region basis for the next five years. <clears throat> We're Doug, excuse me, but which, which category is Spencer Cove in? It's in the north of Griffith category. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, what we're proposing to do for the next five years is the same approach um, using the same funding level. Um, so uh, in 21, uh, that being this, this summer, uh, we would work in the south of Griffith area um, I am proposing to include Spinnaker Cove in that project, even though it is in the north of Griffith area. And the reason for that is because uh, they, Spinnaker Cove is probably the area that needs attention the most um, and, and there are historical reasons for that. Um, but I don't want to uh, work in the north of Griffith area uh, this summer because the Charlotte Water Project is still going on. So I want to wait for them to get out of the way. So that's why I've bundled that the way I have. So we're proposing to work in the south of Griffith area in 21, adding Spinnaker Cove, north of Griffith, central, east central, and then uh, the east. So basically working our way east to west over five years. Um, we're requesting $300,000 of capital funding combining that with $300,000 of Powell Bill funding um, for a total of $600,000 per year, $3 million over five years. Every year, I will have to come back with, to you uh, to approve a contract. If we go this route, uh, every paving contract will be $600,000, which is over the formal limit of $500,000 and requires this board's approval. So if we proceed this way, not only would I get approval tonight, but I would seek approval every year for the project uh, for, uh, for that year. So that's it in a nutshell. And again, this is, uh, uh, we're revisiting this after the February 23rd meeting. Um, one question I did have at the February 23rd meeting was about Powell Bill, our gas tax revenue and the impact from COVID. And I've learned uh, since then that um, that Powell Bill has been delinked from the gas tax and so it from, from gasoline consumption. And, and so it is part of the, the budget that the state legislature approves every year and is based on population and street miles. So with that, I'd be glad to take any questions.
Doug, can I ask a quick um, related question? Because um, you mentioned it. You don't want to conflict with the work that Charlotte Water is doing. And we talked about that intentional trying to, to deconflict. Um, but um, is there the expectation that the roads where they have already worked will stay as is and that all the paving will be done at once? And if so, is there anything that we're going to do to mitigate um, those of us that traveled up to um, the vaccination clinic the other day are all too aware of what the residents face every day of getting up um, Sloan and uh, and everything with the, the current state of the road? And do we do we have a timeline on that? Yeah, so um, they are required as part of their project where their their work is waterline work and they are typically cutting a trench in the roadway and so on roads where that trench falls in the travel lane they are required to pave that entire travel lane out to the middle of the road what we call the crown um, on roads like Shearer street where that trench is essentially falling in the middle of the street they're resurfacing that entire road yeah, I, I got so, that. But my question is, are they going to start paving like the work that they've already done? Or are they going to wait and pave Sloan Street once they complete the entire extension all the way up Beatty to 115? Yeah, they will be paving some of it as they go along and patching some of it as they go along. And probably what we would call mill and pave will, will all take place at once, but it certainly will be patching uh, areas um, uh, as they go along so that they'll just be covering um, gravel. Uh, gravel areas where they've excavated with pavement in the meantime. Yes. Okay. But they won't be resurfacing the entire road as they go along. They'll probably okay. plan to do that. Overall, the uh, excellent presentation, though. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Doug? Just thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Like, is this an action item for tonight, Jamie? Yes, sir. It is. The motion proposed is the, with the board is asked to approve the 2021 through 2026 five year pavement plan. So moved. Okay. So, Commissioner Campbell, are you making that motion? Yes. Do I need to okay. restate it? Or are we good? This one I fully understand. Thank you. Okay. Betsy, you want me to restate it or are we good? Okay. okay. Nope. Short and sweet. Call on the vote. Commissioner Fort. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Campbell. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Michael. Yes. Commissioner Fuller. Yes. And Commissioner Sitton. Yes. Okay. That carries. Doug, thank you so much. Is he there? He is. Okay. Thanks, yes. Doug. I appreciate yes. your work on that. And I'm sure uh, I can tell you from uh, the, the folks that have reached out for our, our previous projects, it's always a welcome phone call that you get from a residence when, when they say our road's done. So uh, yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, item D um, will be discussed recognition of David Auger, former MI Connection Continuum CEO I'm going to turn this over to town manager, Jamie Justice. Thank you, Mayor. This is an action item the board wanted to have some discussion about. So uh, in late 2019, the towns, of course, sold the continuum broadband and cable operation to TDS. Prior to that sale in May, the continuum CEO, David Auger, had passed away. He had been the CEO for eight years, and it really laid the foundation for improving the system's viability as an asset which led ultimately to the successful sales. So uh, the two towns had had some informal discussions after he passed about what's appropriate to recognize David in some way. And we really just kind of set that aside to get the sale done. And then recently we've had a citizen suggest considering some type of naming of award after David Auger. Uh, and specifically the suggestion was the Davidson Main Street Grant Award. And that really brought it back to our attention of we, we need to we need to figure out a way to, to recognize him and what makes sense. One of the ideas that was talked about between Mooresville and Davidson back at the time was uh, was to join with our chambers. And because his impact was so much was not only Davidson, but also 
you know, the areas that Continuum served and, and specifically Morrisville and Davidson and the, you know, the impact there was that perhaps we go in together and come up with some type of recognition. So spoke with the Lake Norman Chamber of Commerce and uh, one thing they identified was that their young professionals group, that there is not a sort of annual young professional year award. And so there was an opportunity there uh, of, to create an award. And, you know, David did a good job really of mentoring staff at Continuum. I was aware of some of that. So in your agenda packet is a proposal to create this award that uh, recognizes an outstanding young professional. It would really be a partnership between the two chambers and really the two towns and to create this annual award. And it could be rotated between the two chambers to present it each year. And uh, we could have a group of representatives from the towns and the chambers to be a, on the selection committees. Criteria could be created. Folks could be nominated and you know, ultimately recommend somebody to get the award and run it through the chambers. So that was the sort of the concept of how that could work. And I just thought that was a, a cool idea. So wanted to bring that, bring that to you all as a board to talk about, to see if that made sense. And if, if you all thought that was a good concept to follow, then we could continue to, we could go work on that further and work towards implementing it. And we've had some discussions with Mooresville and they're very interested in this concept. So Mayor, I don't know if you've got anything new information wise on that front. No, I, I, I talked to Mayor Atkins about this a couple of weeks ago and we're hoping to get together one day this week and have lunch so we can continue this dialogue. He was very favorable and, uh, he was going to run it past his team and talk to the commissioners as well. But ultimately, I think this is something that uh, because David crossed boundaries between the two towns uh, with what he did, I, I think that recognition uh, in some kind of duality with the two chambers would be uh, uh, an outstanding way to, to uh, remember David for his contribution to the area. Yeah, I mean, I think David deserves the recognition and you know some of the most ardent anti-continuum citizens that we had i remember when david came and gave a presentation on all the things that continuum were doing and how they were trying to move forward and grow and he took the time after the meeting to meet one-on-one -on -one with every citizen that wanted to sit down with them and they were generally the people that were the most unhappy about the town owning continuum and each and every single one of them walked out that night and made a comment to me of how impressed with David they were and how much better they felt about Continuum having heard uh, what what David had to say and then being able to meet with them one on one. And, you know, his impact on helping us get out of that situation that we were in cannot be understated. And uh, whatever we can do to honor uh, David, who spent literally the rest of his life working to get that business sold. Uh, he, he deserves every bit of recognition we can offer. He, um, when I went to his funeral, it was so unique to run into people that hadn't worked with him in 30 years, but heard about him dying and came all the way to Charlotte from Phoenix or California or Chicago or wherever. I mean, it was, it was amazing to see this hodgepodge of people that, that worked in the different levels of cable television and 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 fiber optics and everything else that were there was just a uh, it was kind of a Heinz fifty seven of people that that came together and it was it was just such a tribute to the guy that he was and and the impact that he had on people and you know I, I know personally I, I I met with him less than a dozen times in the eight years he was here but. It, he definitely made an impact on me because of, of the person that he was, the drive he had, but the sincerity and, and the heart that he had. So I think know, knowing that this is something that, that we could potentially move forward to recognize uh, uh, young business leaders, uh, I, I think uh, if they would do a little research, that's, you know, when we first started talking about grants, you think half the people don't even know who David Auger is, but, but that's why, you know, uh, if you do it through the chamber and you recognize 
young business leaders, I think it, 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 the impact carries itself on for, for posterity. And I think that's the most important thing. And I, and I think putting it in the hands of the, of the Bill Russells of the world, they're going to do a great job with it. You know, Bill, Bill is top notch and we're lucky to have him at the Lake Norman chamber. And um, no, I know Bill will do it right. And I'm sure that the town of Mooresville uh, chamber will. Yeah. Do the same. No doubt. No doubt. Yep. Absolutely. Thank the bill for, for this idea. Well, I think we just continue moving forward with this, Jamie. Um, I'll, I'll try to get uh, some further input from Morsel this week. And uh, I, I'm sure that uh, if we give Bill some directive, he can reach out to the Morsel chamber and we can start uh, moving in the right direction to get this accomplished sooner than later. Okay. Does anybody feel differently? So my action item would be to keep working on this. Does anybody feel differently about that? Okay. I'm gonna good idea. Go for it. Okay. Sounds good. Gotcha. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, next is item E, which is an action item, and I'm going to call on Assistant Town Manager Karen Witcher to talk to us about our public facilities update. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, unfortunately, this isn't a happy update. Uh, um, during the course of the renovation work at 251 South Street, where they are removing the ceilings such that we can get modern infrastructure into the building, things like air conditioning, IT cabling, and then put the ceilings back in a way that's contextually sensitive to the building. Uh, um, the workers were concerned by how some of the dust looked. So the way asbestos remediation works, because we already had remediation going on with the floor tile, uh, and we had a third party monitor on site, they agreed that it didn't look great. So they sent off for um, some testing and have found it's additional asbestos in the ceilings and also the plaster walls of the auditorium. Uh, so in talking with this with our team, the architects and edifice, we really still need to proceed with removing the ceilings and abating the asbestos, not only in the ceilings, but also the plaster walls. Uh, and we had a lot of conversation about the auditorium walls, but because of the level of water damage, the thought is that we'd have to disturb so much and we'd be in a remediation standpoint that it's best just to remove those and then put them back. We have talked with Stuart Gray about what that would look like and what that would mean and, and got his feedback. So we would put them back in a way that he is asking us to do. Uh, so the bottom line is what I have for you tonight is a change order um, to the contract with Edifice. Um, and it's a not to exceed. The thought process is if you will give us authority to amend the contract uh, um, for $239,574, Edifice is working to get that price down. So they're negotiating with the current sub on the site. They may put it back out to bid, but if you all will approve the change order, what that means is that we're then able to continue have Edifice working, stay on the project timeline and proceed with the demolition. And with that, I'll pause and ask if there's any questions. One question I have is, um, is this, how does this, how does this get factored in or apparently excluded from the manager at risk part of, of this contract? So Edifice is working with us. They're not charging us the typical fees that go with that. This is a straight pass through. So they're a great partner and a collaborator on that. So the, the change order really is just for the sub. Um, and like I said, Edifice is working <coughs> either to get the sub to get a better price or to put it back out at risk. And that's, why the construction manager at risk process is so good. They have an obligation to work on our interests and they have an incentive in project cost savings, right? So it's kind of a dual, dual activity. So that's how that's working with this. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering, uh, so, so this, is not, this is not considered an at-risk part of the contract? I do not believe so, no. I can look into that for you though, David. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just curious. I mean, I, I mean, obviously it needs to be done, uh, but I'm wondering as we go through this process, you know, what what other what other surprises may pop up that will, we'll, you know, if 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 the if the unexpected is not at risk, then then it's it's not really an at risk project. Yeah, I think David brings up a valid question as far as what falls under the at risk and what does not fall under the at risk and. 
you know, the, the big pitch was, is, Hey, we're going to go do this at risk. And then anything, any surprises that come up are on them, not us. And I see the question. Let me answer it a different try. way. It's on us. <laughs> yeah. So what we proceeded with is um, the targeted demolition to do the project as quickly as possible. Y'all have not approved the guaranteed maximum price, which comes in May. And that's when the at risk is set set. Uh, um, this would have come up anyway. Uh, um, honestly, if y'all would have waited, they still would have found the asbestos in the ceilings. But after that, it would have shown up in a different way in the contract. So, so we we haven't we haven't signed the contract. No, you authorized Jamie to sign the targeted demolition contract a few meetings ago, and that's an amendment to the current contract you have with Edifice. Um, which is leading down the path to the guaranteed maximum price, which is we're working through that. The schedule is to put the hard bids out in the next couple of weeks. And that's what generates the, the guaranteed maximum price, which you all will review at a couple of meetings in May. So, th so that'll be a question then is, is, is that for that final contract to delineate what is at risk and what isn't. Absolutely. Yeah, we can get that to you, David. And so for Karen, the viewership, you might have said this, Karen, and I missed it, but this was something we tested for and uh, prior to and was undetected, apparently. Correct. <laughs> the ceilings were tested um, and the auditorium walls were tested in June going into the project um, ahead of some exploratory demolition, um, and nothing was found um, at that point. Any other discussion? So Karen, just confirming the, the number that you need is 239-577-58. Correct, and that is a two not exceed. I do anticipate it'll, the actual cost will be less after we work through the process. Okay, so we're looking at, make, I'm making a motion to approve the proposed change order not to exceed the amount of $239,577.58. So if you don't want to round up. So motion's been made by Mayor Pro Tem Campbell. I will do a roll call unless there's any other discussion. Hearing none, Commissioner Sitton. Yes. Commissioner Fuller. Yes. Commissioner Michael. Yes. Commissioner Ford. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Campbell. Yes. Thank you. Go forth and abate. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Karen. And thanks for the update, too. Uh, and thanks for the picture of the audience. Thanks, Karen. No chairs in it. Uh, that was a big old cavity with no chairs in the auditorium. That was an interesting picture. So, okay. Uh, next on the agenda is item F and that's to review upcoming agenda items. I'm gonna turn this over to town manager, Jamie Justice. Thanks Mayor. Betsy will pull up that uh, document. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, March 23rd, our next meeting, uh, we'll introduce a couple of highlights. We'll introduce the new executive director of Davidson Housing Coalition, Gerald Wright. So that'll be really good. And then an arts and science council presentation. We also will want to talk with you about that 160D general statute compliance. We're on a timeline deadline to get that done by the end of this fiscal year. So planning director will be here to talk about that. We're working on the growth management, but I think that is likely gonna to need to go to the April meeting and we're gonna to need to move the general statute 160D forward because of that timeline. And then we'll be bringing those growth management options to the board in April. One really cool highlight is the sustainability plan that our subcommittees have been working on. They're ready to come present to the board March 23rd. That's a strategic plan action item. So. I think you'll hear some exciting recommendations there. Uh, we'll come back to you, uh, potentially have some discussion about the non-discrimination ordinance. Our folks have been working on that as well. So I think uh, hopefully we'll be ready to, to bring that discussion to you. And then we're, as we discussed previously, the private development projects in Cornelius, we are, are waiting on one of them to be submitted to Cornelius as an actual application. 
And at that point, we'll know exactly what's being proposed, how many units, like all those, all those things. And then we wanted to schedule bringing that to the town board to talk about both those projects. So we're, we're working on that. And so anticipating that could be as early as March 23rd. So those are some of the highlights for the 23rd. Any, any questions about that? No, sir. All right. Okay, I think I, I just, I wanna keep beating the drum that we talked about earlier on moving forward on that small area plan or whatever those options are. I mean, I think now is the time where it's fresh in everybody's minds. We've got high level of engagement from Davidson Point residents. We've got high level of engagement from the community. Let's not lose that momentum. Makes sense. We'll keep, uh, we'll work on it and see when we can bring it to you as soon as we can. Jamie, one thing that I noticed on the work session for the 13th of April, is that supposed to be discussed Sloan Street house move agreement with Habitat, not Shear Street? No, it actually is Shear Street. So this is a question mark because I'm not sure if it'll be ready, but uh, this is the town owned house on Shear Street that is, uh, we, is what we've partnered with Hope to Home for. Right. And is, is a part of the footprint of the proposed Beatty Park. Beatty. Okay, gotcha. So what we're thinking is the model with that, with that Sloan Street house, we could potentially do the same thing here with a Habitat loaned, owned lot on Shear Street, which would make a relatively short move and we're able to keep a, an affordable housing unit. So, yeah. so that's the thinking that may be our best move and we're trying to work on some of that, those details now. So that, that's what we were uh, considering recommending. That, Jamie, is that that lot that is specifically that I guess backs up towards the, the railroad tracks that there was, I guess, question years ago in terms of, you know, what could actually go on that lot? And anyways, I guess a back and forth in that conversation. So that's the lot, the one in question. Karen, unless you know specifically, I'm not 100% sure on, on the lot. I know Habitat has some at the end of Shear Street. Yeah, they do have some. I'm not entirely sure. I'd have to look at it. Yeah, I think it's on the... the would be the northeast side of, of Shearer Street. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Anything for the common good? Jamie, would you like to summarize? The action items I have, other than what was already approved, We'll, on the Livability Board nonprofit grant process, we'll share the video with the board and work on bringing that back to the town board. And then we had the three votes on the Charlotte Water Waterline. So I've got those, or actually two, two votes, which are actionable. All right, on the David Auger recognition, we'll proceed with that approach. Uh, and the, we'll work on the what's at risk for the public facilities going forward. So those are the action items I wrote down. Okay. All right, anything else? I need a motion. Need a motion to go to closed session. Oh, I'll make exactly. a motion that we go to closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A3, consult with attorney, attorney client privilege. Motion's been made. I will do a roll call to Mr. Sitton. Yes. 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 Mr. Fuller. Yes. Mr. Michael. Commissioner Michael. Yes. Commissioner Fort. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Campbell. Yes. So we will now leave this public meeting and we are adjourned to go to um, closed session and we will not return. So thank you for tuning in and uh,